I cannot tell you how excited I am to have you on the show. Now, I don't know if, well, I sent you the email, right? Because of our introduction from Brad, but that's yes. how we know each other. And I started to look for guests because this is my first show. Do you have any idea this is my first show? I did. Yes, okay. I saw that. That's only that's only up the uh, the nerve <laughs> quotient on this end. But I'm here. I, I'm your well, I appreciate guest. it. I am. I, I am. I am honored. I don't know what what won me the honor, but I'm I'm happy well, to hear about that too. <laughs> let me tell you the honor. So, long story short, is that I wrote a book. Um, it's called Joey Somebody: The Life and Times of a Recovering Douchebag. Okay. And the reason that I wrote it was one of my best friends was killed in a car accident on May twenty second, twenty seventeen. Oh my god! I'm and sorry. his wife called me. Thank you. His wife called me and said, "Joey, I would like you to do the eulogy." And I want you to make it Joey funny. The church needs some laughter. It's a very dark day. Um, and I said, sure, I'd be honored to do that. And so I flew back to Minnesota. And I was in my mommy's house where I grew up, which is right next door to Jay, my buddy, who died. And as I was writing the eulogy, I realized that if my little boys, at the time, they were six and four. And so if I got killed in a car accident, they would not know who I am at all. They would hear from my wife that, you know, your daddy loved you so much and he was, your, he was your coach and he was a good husband. And then my buddies in the ad world would be like, your daddy was so funny and your daddy was a really cool guy and blah, blah, blah. And he had great clothes and whatever they might have said about me, but they never would have known about my insecurity. And I had decades long struggle with insecurity and anxiety, uh, depression, all that stuff. And sure. <laughs> tell me what that's like. So, no, go ahead. I can well, tell you. <laughs> well, that's, that's exactly what. So we met, I think, through Brad Barron's on sure. Facebook. And either I friended you or you friended me. I'm not even sure how that happened. And I went to, uh, I went to both high school and college with Brad. Correct. So. Correct. And so I was, while I was looking for this, I have this kind of theory in my life that has been part of my problem as a man, is that if your heroes are assholes, who are you and who do you become? And my heroes growing up were not good men. I mean, we'll talk about this too, but like sure. one of the business books I remember reading in, in college was Donald Trump, Art of the Deal. And I remember looking at Steve Jobs as one of the coolest guys in the world and looking at Larry Ellison. And now nowadays it's like Elon Musk and all of these captains of industry. And that was kind of the thing for me. It was like, wow, these are a, the guys. That's right? these are the, that is a who's who of douchebags and Exactly. And I, much, and I don't even know that much about <laughs> business. I know more about douchebags than I know about the business well, world. But you really, you, that's like, uh, that's murderer's row. It's the 27 <laughs> Yankees. I mean, you even had like the Tony Lazari in there. Of, uh, <laughs> go ahead, exactly go ahead. It. Well, no, that's exactly it. And so I became a douchebag. And so it was only in my 50s that I kind of realized like, oh, I got to write about this. And so if my heroes were assholes and I became one, who are my children's heroes? Yes. And I thought of you. And really? I thought, you know what? I want my kids to be like Brian Behar. Oh I God, want that's, that's stunning. I, 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 do you mind if I go grab my kids because they would not say <laughs> the same thing? They, I it's... guarantee you they wouldn't. Yeah, you know, like, I go oh, great. That. Unemployed dad is doing another podcast. <laughs> well, <laughs> so am I. Getting, how about getting a job? <laughs> well, we can talk about that too. I've been unemployed for three years writing this book and oh, living wow. off of my wife. <laughs> And okay. dealing with all the manhood issues that come with that. So oh, we can, absolutely. So we can get so, into that. <laughs> oh, I was. Oh, I thought I was gonna. I thought I was gonna hit you up for a job at the end of this. You so can, maybe that you can do that. But I have no money to pay you. <laughs> okay. Well, then that will be the exact same income that I have now. Uh, same here. So, so, so it same should here. be. It, it should really uh, fit in with my lifestyle. <laughs> it should. That's the goal. And so I, I did my homework on you. Right, we've never met, so this is cool that I get to meet you live. It's true, in everyone, we have never met. This we've never met. Um, I listened to the F Word podcast, okay. which was that was when I fell in love with Brian Behar officially because it was you have a very wonderful delivery with humor woven in between very dark circumstances. Your father's suicide, obviously, being I think the most pronounced in your writing. Sure. It was magnanimous of you to do it because you didn't know who I was from Adam. And that's why I called Brad and I said, call up your boy from Brown and uh, put in a good word for me. Um, but well, thank you. Thank you for saying that I went to Brown. I, was hoping I had to get that in there. 
I, had I was to get hoping that in there. she knew I was going to get that in there <laughs> at least six times between now and the introduction, the end of the introduction. So, dude, if I went to Brown or Harvard, I would have it tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> Just to be yeah. clear, right? I dropped out of junior college, so it doesn't oh. it doesn't look quite as good on my forehead as Brownwood. But I turned yeah. down Stanford. I have to get that in. So you'll <laughs> well, get, and, we'll get to the and Berkeley. And Berkeley. And Berkeley. Berkeley. Yes, those. Yes, those are the three I got in. <laughs> Fuck you, Harvard and Yale. <laughs> exactly. Well, they don't know what they're missing. <laughs> they could have had you on their alumni list. That yeah, been I haven't worked in fifteen months. I've proven you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> No, this well, right. No. That's actually part of the thing. You've been on 22 sitcoms in 22 years, correct? Or 21 sitcoms in 22 years? 22 sounds 22 sounds right. Um, yeah. There was a period where there were more shows than years, but I just did five years on uh, Fuller House, the yes. Fuller House reboot on Netflix. So at the very least, I've now caught up in years <laughs> in sitcoms. So That's like, good. But That's I am, good. I am a like, you know, I am a classic journeyman, you know, yes. in, in the parlance of baseball, I'm the Reggie Sanders or Ken Brett of uh, TV writing. I, you know, it's, I would love to have been on, you know, Raymond or Frazier for nine or 11 years. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't been in the card. So uh, it, you know, for the most part, it's been a show a year. Uh, some years there were no shows and some years there were two very short orders, but I've, you know, really sort of had to cobble, cobble a career together kind of entrepreneurially, which is not, if I had an entrepreneurial spirit, I would have been an entrepreneur, not a, you know, <laughs> not an anxious yeah. comedy writer trying to, you know, exercise my demons with jokes. So those two things are sort of paradoxical, but you, you sort of have to, you have to embrace the, uh, the chaos of, uh, of show business as I, as I see, a lot of people are doing it all in all kinds of fields now. Uh, I think they're just sort of catching up in terms of the uncertainty that uh, this that's kind of inherent in show business. Well, as this journeyman, though, you did get there. You became the showrunner the last two years, correct? That is correct. That um, you know, for those who may or may yes, not explain what that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For those who may not as be as savvy in the parlance of <laughs> of uh, TV writing. Uh, the showrunner is, you know, I, I, I guess it's not that tricky and sort of evident in the, in the words, but you're the executive producer who is in charge of running, running the show. But what's interesting about that, a couple things, one is in my previous 23 years in the business, I had never been a showrunner. Right. Um, I had kind of resigned myself to the fact that that wasn't in the cards and, you know, maybe I was good at, I had certain skill sets like, you know, writing scripts and telling jokes and being valuable to a, to a boss, but I had not seen myself as a boss and I thought that ship had sailed. So that's one thing. And the other thing is what they don't tell you is you rise high enough in the world of sitcom writing, you suddenly take on the role of a CEO of a, of an operation. And like, you know, my writing partner at the time and I were, as co-showrunners in charge of 200 people. Um, wow. And as I said, you know, as I sort of alluded to earlier, the type of person who has like, you know, either the sensitivity or the shyness to want to write jokes and kind of hide behind humor is tends not to be someone who has the same co emotional constitution as someone who sets out to be like, I want to be the CEO of a business. Right. And so that it, it is a an interesting conflict that sort of happens once you rise high enough. But it did, and I fought through it, and I and I turned down the job twice, even though it was obviously like a like a huge, you know, would be a huge boon to my career. Um, although it hasn't proven to be, but in theory, in theory, <laughs> it was supposed to be. Um, but I turned it down twice, thinking that that wasn't something that I was capable of doing. That even even having been appointed. My insecurity was so massive that I that I assumed I was not capable, and that fear would win out. That my anxiety would preclude me from being able to do the job. So we said no. We ref we referred other people, but they kept coming back. So eventually, we deferred to their wisdom, and we ran the show. I I think very successfully for the last couple of years. So if anyone has kids and they've had to sit sit and watch the final two seasons of Fuller House. You have me to blame. But, uh, I just need <laughs> well, to say I did not create the show. 
I was a I was a writer on the staff, but I, I took over in, in the final two seasons. So I don't want I don't want to give the impression that I created it or right, right. had anything to do with the original. But um, that's all public. That's all public record and court well, and record. But I'm not. Actually, allowed, but I'm not allowed to talk about that, that. Exactly, we can't talk about that. But there you, you, go. you wrote you write a lot about your anxiety, and you write that anxiety in your head and what you envision compared to what actually takes place in the event is nowhere near as bad as it was when you thought about it, right? That is, yeah, no, they, they, there are those, including my female Israeli therapist, who think that <laughs> that is my uh, savant skill, is, yeah. Brian, you're a, you're a, you know, a hero at anticipatory anxiety, which means <laughs> that I am constantly, right. and that was my really bad Israeli accent, having never been there, <laughs> But, uh, but but despite the name, I am Jewish, so I can't say that. Um, yes. No, I, I often, often or, or always, you know, I mean, it's obviously sort of diminished as the years have gone on, but, you know, what I do is I sort of anticipate worst case catastrophic scenarios. And, you know, for much of my, definitely my childhood, but certainly much of my, even my adult professional life, that has been an impediment towards, uh, you know, that, you know, pursuing all the things that I really wish I had been, had the courage to pursue. You know, I often come back a lot to, you know, it may not be as binding as, you know, as things that my therapist said, but to Albert Brooks's movie, Defending Your Life, where, <laughs> you know, when he's trying to get into heaven, like the real thing that is an obstacle in, in, the, in the eyes of God is that so much of his life was guided by fear. And I, yeah. it sounds like you and I probably around, sim, you know, I don't know if it was similar ages, but like sort of similar trajectories that we kind of both decided, I don't want that to be my story. I don't want to look yeah. back at, with regret. I don't <laughs> want my kids to only be someone who didn't do things and didn't pursue all the, th all the dreams that I had. And, you know, consequently, the last, you know, and I'm happy to talk about your journey as well, but, you know, for me, the last five years of my life have been sort of demonstrably different than the previous 50, in that I, I finally have started trying everything and writing everything and not being governed by anticipatory anxiety as much, which is not to say it's not there on a daily basis and it's something that I don't wrestle with. But I really, really have tried the last five years. It's certainly a lot of it is a function of losing your father to suicide. And we can get into sort of how that's informed a lot of the decisions since then. But like my sort of overall governing principle is like if I can survive that, like, you know, yeah. writing an article about it is not as scary as having actually having gone through it. Or, well, you, you know. You also mentioned that you didn't even start to really live your life until after your dad's suicide. What do you, what did you mean by that? I don't remember saying that, but I trust that you know me better than I, than I know the works of yeah. Brian. Yeah. No, no, I, no, you don't need to, you don't need to quote it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to take me. I, I have it in my notes, but yeah. Oh my God. You can say almost anything about me and I'll believe you. you know, I'm on so many pills to, to, to do this podcast that I'm like, <laughs> it sounds right. Uh, uh, An Alexa Pro Xanax cocktail. Yes, that is the exact cocktail. And in fact, I <laughs> and in fact, I right one minute before we started, I ran out and had another quarter Xanax when I was convinced that no one would stop vacuuming. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I I actually can relate on that anxiety front. But what I what I, I was taken aback by that because, you know, I think I shared with you that my little my little brother took his own life in two thousand and seven, and so. Yes. Suicide for me changed. I didn't get to that for years in therapy. The, the next year was a blur of alcohol and women and travel and fancy hotels and airfare. And, and I just how, wanted how to- How your wife live. feel about that? This is before I was married. Oh, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't know I was <laughs> that would have been really like, awkward. Yeah, that would have been- The really guy's awkward. like a- the guy's a self-labeled douchebag, people. I didn't know. I didn't know how. <laughs> right. No, douchebags definitely cheat, but I was not I was a single man at that point. Okay, um, good. No, yes. uh, just to, to your immediate point, um, I didn't get to any sort of 
like epiphany or or you know like really kind of healed place for over a decade so like i don't want to give the impression that like, my dad died and then i walked in you know i walked out of one therapy session saying well, no, you know true. like <laughs> yeah. I, you know i have a bucket list i think our for our my first year was as much of a blur as it seems yours was and you know um i already had a wife and kid so the you know the women the womanizing wasn't as 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 pronounced but um that was a joke um <laughs> more more like, pancakes and bacon <laughs> <laughs> yes yes there was a there was a lot of there was a lot of ihop at least in the yes. week immediately following and i still lost five pounds famously so <laughs> I, you know not that i wish that's what stress will do to you but yeah. that's what stress will do for you i had yeah. i ate nothing but chocolate chip pancakes and and sausage for a week and still lost five pounds and i've, wow. been, I've been putting it on ever since so. <laughs> um so yeah, so now, um, as far as kind of realizing that I could, I shouldn't live in fear anymore. It took, it took like a good, probably close to a decade after. I mean, um, I I started writing about it. I think in like 2015. So it's about seven years seven years after and as i'm sure you you've experienced in some form there's such a stigma attached to to suicide even for someone mm -hmm. on the familial end who's just going through it ex just experiencing experiencing the shock and the pain and the disbelief and, and the depression like even for people like us there's still a stigma there's still a taboo towards talking about it. You know, there really is that feeling that like it, it'll put people ill at ease. So, yeah. you know, I definitely got a lot of coaching from people in my life. Like, don't talk about it. You know, it's only going to make people not want to hear you. You know, like in the, in the immediate aftermath, I wrote a few pilots that were loosely based on it, but the word suicide was never mentioned. It was always like there was an unexpected death or the patriarch died suddenly. But like, you know, my partner, my agents, like, <laughs> everyone really wanted me to like not be known as like the suicide guy. Yeah. And uh, I, I understand that, but I also found, I find and have found that not being authentic is the worst thing I can do. Yeah. But so, and as a result, I felt like I was keeping the secret. Um, you know, in much the same way that my father was keeping secrets and ultimately led to his death, I felt that I now was keeping his secret. You know, the people who were very close to me knew that he died by suicide. But, like, I don't know the average person, uh, certainly nobody on social media, nobody I, you know, knew casually within the, the television <laughs> business would have known. Yeah. Uh, now everybody knows. People are like, now shut up about it. We get it. You're, you know, I hope they're not like that. But... I certainly do. I'm certainly not afraid of talking about it. And uh, there has been a tremendous amount of pushback from people who don't want me to talk about it. That's come from within my family. Your own family as well. From my family, yes. That's, from your family as well? Um, no, my, it was hard for our family to admit it because my little brother was an addict and an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, and he suffered from bipolar. So it was one of those things where there was so much going on with him and they couldn't figure out the cocktail um, to help him out, pardon the pun, um, because he was so drunk all the time. And so oh. over the years, he would, you know, he'd, he'd go up and down and he'd call me and say he was going to go to law school and then he was going to start his own firm. And, he was, and I'm like, dude, <laughs> you haven't even attended college yet. You know, you need to do that first and, and then talk him down. And then I call my mom and say, hey, Stevie's manic again. You know, what are you going to do with that? Um, so it was just like my mom not dealing well with it. Um, I found him. He came out to California April 1st to visit and he was going to stay with us. And I told him, I said, dude, I love you. Financially, I can help you out now. And um, why don't we just, you know, put our lives back together? And, and yeah. we went down to a a rehab center where he was going to help um, coach others. And so that was really cool. We had that really cool day together. Um, and then we went to my office and he hung out with some of my mates. 
we went to dinner or lunch uh, on the pier over here in Pier 39. That's where my agency was. And uh, we had a great time and everything was cool. And then um, I said, you know, I'll meet you back at home. I'm going to go for a motorcycle ride after work. And then I went, to motor, I went for a motorcycle ride and uh, came back about seven o'clock and came in the house. I was like, Stevie, what's up? You know, and nothing. Yeah. I didn't hear anything. And so then I walked into my bathroom and um, he was floating uh, face down purple and he was dead. And uh, so just, sorry. yeah, wow. thanks. It just kicked my ass. And so that moment, you know, there was an aerosol can um, perched on the sink. And so what I didn't know, in addition to all the drugs and alcohol, he was huffing. And I don't know if you know what that is, but uh, it's... Uh, no, yeah, not through experience, but yeah. You, yeah, you inhale. For those who don't know, it's you would actually take a. It's like the the cans that you spray off your computers with, you know, and they have this refrigeration propellant inside there that gets you super high. It takes all the oxygen out of your lungs and it screws up your brain for a while. And you have a, I think it's a twenty seven percent chance of death the first time you do it. So it was like he knew what he was doing, and and he was, you know. After the autopsy, we find all this other stuff, you know, alcohol in his system. And so he, I didn't know he was doing any of this stuff. Um, and so we as a family didn't want to admit that it was suicide. My mom didn't want to admit it. I didn't want to admit it, you know. So it was just something where I had to take a while to get through that. And then only recently, like when my brother and I penned this book, uh, my brother's my co-author on the book, and uh, we wrote about our dysfunctional family, you know. And I said, Paul, Stevie's suicide is not something we ever dealt with. You know, as a family, and he said we didn't deal with anything as a family. You know, do you deal with it? Do you deal with it in the book? Is it? Oh yeah, it's the first chapter. You know, we talk about the funeral, um, and then we remove the death scene, which is you know, as I start to read about your stuff, I was, I was touched by the fact that you can be attacked by folks online for you know divulging things and saying you're trying to get Facebook likes or you're trying to get. You know, yeah, no, no, articles. Oh, no, well, you, you, you've, you've delved in, even into the attackers. That's yeah. Uh, it's what's what's interesting. Uh, just first of all, I'm so sorry that you've had to go through it, both thanks. in general and as someone who had to just you know, as someone who was trying to help, and as someone who had to just ultimately to, you know discover the the body. Um, I can relate in a in a couple ways. Some some you know, some that are, might be a little more unexpected, you know, which kind of is what makes me kind of the all purpose suicide guest. I'm af- I'm afraid is you know because not only and, and I, I really can't get into the too many specifics, um, but I can say that you know not only did I lose my father to suicide um, under very different circumstances, which were he always seemed fine, happy, and effervescent, and well-to-do, and then all of that proved to be a facade that we knew nothing about until after he was dead. But I also have a close relative who was, has a story, you know, largely akin to what you just described, um, b- bipolar. So I've been, that's something that I've additionally had to wrestle with in my family of origin, um, you know, to, you know, he, he is still alive, but we are no longer in contact. But, but it sounds like we've had mm. similar experiences in terms of trying to be the one yeah, sorry. to keep that, to help that person along, keep that person alive. And, and, and that's its own burden. I mean, I, I, obviously it's not a greater burden than losing that, that person, but you know, the, Dealing with someone who might be manic depressive, bipolar, um, or suicidal carries with it its own its own weights and its own really dark, painful challenges that like can be. It, it's it's not like it is in the movies. It's not like no. you know, like oh, you know, a, a happy story where you, you say it like for each time I've like literally or figuratively thought I saved this person's life. It's just a matter of going off. And then, and then you're back into sort of trying to begin the process over again, and it's it, it, it's a terrible disease that, that sadly feels like a kind of a never-ending process. And one, you know, I'm not sure I'm proud to say this, but I've had to remove myself 
for my own safety and my own sanity, um, just because it, it it no longer was working within the confines of my life and my family and my well being. But um, I, I just I just wanted yeah. to note that I I know a little of, I know a little of what you're going through, both in terms of being a suicide loss survivor, but also someone trying to prevent suicide on the other end. Yeah. Um, it, just in my case, it happens to be two different people. And, yeah. uh, and I thought I was the crazy one in the family, so, <laughs> you know, that's the, uh, you know, like, you know, like, the, you know, like I, I would, you know, assumed I was be the most, you know, likely suspect to, you know, to require help. But, uh, sort of as I've gotten older, what appeared on the surface to be a very normal, traditional, you know, Jewish nouveau riche suburban, LA family like is just full of uh unwellness and you know mental illness and you know just really toxic family dynamics even in dealing with it and discussing and I I am sure the mere fact that I'm talking about any of this uh aloud will also engender a really hostile response I mean when I the few times I wrote about my father's suicide and I went out of my way. I didn't assign blame because I don't think there is blame. Yeah. Um, I was just talking about what I, I, to me, it was a mystery and I was trying to unravel what happened and, and sort of, you know, sort of one of the things I came down to was like, you know, like I think my father fell prey to a lot to the, the tribulations of, li- of the pressures of living in, in, in Los Angeles and having to, continually put on a show of of wealth and well-being yeah. you know to others in his community you know to others in his suburb to those in his tennis club you know like and once once sort of the wealth and well-being was no longer the truth i think there was a, a great deal of shame for him you know someone who had really like made his own way his parents you know had they themselves had emigrated from from Turkey around you know the time of World War One, so he like paid his way through college. He really made it, and then you know I discovered later that like a lot of the money that he had made was gone, or most of it, if I'm being perfectly honest. And I think the shame that comes with that, with sort of not being able to provide for your family as a as a man in society, which is not to say that. There, are, there isn't probably an equal amount of pressure on, on women, but I'm just saying there are some sort of, sort of specific traits in, in terms of male fragility and, yeah. um, and, and, you know, and like kind of the pressures we put on ourselves to be providers. I realize I'm not being that funny. Am I, am I, am I doing okay? Well, there, the, there's no, there's, the cool thing, there's no pressure here. I think that <laughs> the one thing that resonates immediately when you talk about your pops and, the pressure he was under, specifically wealth. You actually write about how you were distraught that your parents sold the Dodge Dart to get the Mercedes. Okay, yes. Okay, so that's, that is the article. Uh, So I should be, I should be a little more clear. Um, Beginning in 2015, I started to be a contributor, a contributing blogger to the Huffington Post. Yes. I wrote, I think, 49 pieces for them. Yep. A lot of them had to do with sort of the aftermath of suicide, with my own depression and anxiety, with aging and show business. Just like I was given the freedom to, for the first time in my life, really write in my own voice about about feelings that I've never expressed anywhere, you know, outside of a therapist chair. Um, and that, and, and then once they once Huffington Post changed their platform and stopped taking outside com- contributors. I've moved a lot of my business over to medium.com. So shout out to yeah. them for letting me, letting me keep writing. So I've written about I think, 65, 70 pieces in the last five years, each one more emo than the next in terms of just <laughs> being like really transparent, you know, like, yeah, you know, I'm the, I think I'm like dashboard confessional of 55 year old men and, uh, and, you know, talking about my feelings, but it's been, you know, it's been incredibly cathartic and incredibly gratifying. So the, the article you referenced and the uh was one was not the first one the first one was like because they said hey do you have any you know a guy reached out to me from huffington post based on my twitter account which 
had nothing really to do with any of these mental health issues. And he's like, do you have anything you want to write about? Uh, and I wrote this piece about very openly about my, both my dad's suicide and like the week and months following and sort of the trials and tribulations of a family really torn asunder by a suicide yeah. loss. Um, so that was fun. But it got a great reception, you know. But it, yeah. but like I never I'd never been open before. I'd never been right. transparent, and 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 by doing so, it felt like it really resonated with a lot of people. And, and the Americans Foundation for Suicide Prevention, American Society, somebody somebody important picked it up and and posted it on their own site, and and it was shared like you know ten thousand times, and that was so. I, it, it, at the very least, besides the you know the cathartic quality that it brought to me, it seemed to be resonating with other people who had gone through similar loss. Which brings us up to this other one, which is exactly the one that that got all the negative attention from within my family. Which was, I told the story back in like around 1978. That, you know, my mother. We were living, we used to live in Van Nuys, which for those of you in, who aren't, you know, scholars of San Fernando Valley geography and history, like I tragically am, um, we moved from, from Van Nuys, which was kind of like middle class. And I mean, it was it historically was a very middle class neighborhood to Encino, which a lot of people know from Encino Man and sort of yep. Valley Girl and Fast mm -hmm. Times and, and yep. you know, Karate Kid, you know, whenever you need like a douchey, you know, a douchey bad guy in an eighties, you know, an eighties teen comedy, oftentimes or more, if they're not, you know, if they're not from Glenbrook or Highland Park in Chicago, they're from they're from Encino. Um, so it was a, definitely a much more upper middle class place. So I had already, I was sort of aware of that that transition, but for the first few years that we uh, we lived there, my mother still drove the same. 1974 Dodge Dart that she um, had driven when we were in Van Nuys. And then one day, like people do, like I don't give that much thought to when I, you know, trade one Prius for the next, but, right. um, <laughs> you know, my, my mother trade, you know, like traded in her solder Dodge Dart and got like a, probably an entry level Mercedes. Now I, I don't know why. Now I was an incredibly fragile child exceedingly <laughs> and unremittingly sensitive but i i think i apparently and this has been confirmed to me by my friend but i cried for like three days <laughs> and it wasn't just like i had i loved that car but like deep down i really even then sensed that there was like a change well yeah that my that my parents were undergoing some sort of change in terms of class in terms of values and apparently, even as like an eight or ten year old, I screamed at them, "You're selling out," you know, which wow. they never, you know, which they never let me forget. But uh, like, I was really distraught. Um, but I used that that story as an example in the article of the facades that people in society, and specifically like Los Angeles and the, sort of the mm -hmm. Jewish suburbs place. Uh, on themselves, you know, to to fit in and to per, to be perceived as successful. Um, and I said that that pressure may ultimately have been what overwhelmed my father when he, he did not have the money to truly back up the, his perceived status. And the next day, like I never slept better than I did that night. Like I really felt like I told a story that helped me understand my father's psychology in the days leading up to his passing and it might help others. I slept beautifully. I woke up and there were messages from my mother oh, ripping into me saying that she never had been less proud of me, that I wasn't really her son, no. that, um, and, and implying that I, that I was blaming her. When in fact I went out of my way to say that it was no one's fault, you did. You know that 
that there was a lot of you know systemic societal factors that, that that were in play, and that you know so much of it had to do with sort of male pride and how he fit into his community, and you know what a loss of income and savings might engender or might rot. But um, wow, I got really really reamed from the family. And then, you know, over the years, another member, a close member of the family who I may or may not have alluded to earlier has taken really like severe objection um, to me writing about the family at all. And specifically about my dad's suicide, claiming that I'm doing it just for likes and I'm doing it just for attention. um, Sort of without any recognition that it's, also, you know, as much as it's his story or as much as it's my mom's story, you know, I went through it too. I might have gone through it in a different way than they did, but I still lost my parent and one of my idols to suicide. Yeah. And it's something that you never stop processing. It may not be a, like, you know, something that's top of mind every minute of every day, but it's certainly something you think about often and and get, and it's and it's a form of grief that can hit you, and as I'm, I'm sure you could probably attest, will hit you when you least expect it. And um, I mean that's sort of one of the natures of grief that they don't tell you about in any of the fifty handbooks that I bought, you know, at uh, at Barnes and Noble the week after he died. You know, I, I walked out of there. I, I must have looked like a real catch you know, about a stack of books about death and grief and suicide and like, you know, like bereavement books. I mean, I mean, I really had everything, but, uh, but that's, that's grief and grief will creep into your life just when you think you're done with it. And that's, yeah, that's a, that's a real, how do you do? Well, you wrote about that too. And, and specifically um, you wrote an article about, I think it was the Kavanaugh article that talked about oh. tri- triggers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I've been triggered a couple times based on that. And, and by the way, sidebar, um, David Foster Wallace was by far my favorite author. So have you finished infinite jest three times front to back? And then maybe a thousand different times that I've picked it up and reread it. I mean, I could go grab it off my bookshelf. It's no, dog-eared. <laughs> I've tried. It's, I've tried to finish it so many times, <laughs> like that. I feel like a fraud. Like I have to give back my Brown degree because I keep trying. I mean, I. I You're not the I, only one, dude. That's believe so me, I drop his. That. Believe me, I drop his name all the time, as if I, you know, <laughs> helped co-write it. But, uh, but go ahead. No, he. I. I, I I'm curious what you're going to say. Uh, well, I, in regards was, to him, because my friend and I, he, he taught it. Um, can't remember the school. It was up here in San Luis Obispo. So Carl, that wasn't Carlton. Um, there's a college in San Luis where he taught. And my friend Kimmy and I, who she turned me on to him as a reader. Yeah. And I, you know, reading other books like Girl with Curious Hair and like some of his short stories is, is it really a better intro <laughs> because sure. like, his opus is just, it's, as he said, it was, I wrote every single page with individual prose. I didn't even care if they connected. You know, and yeah, so like no, the first, I, I, I certainly picked up on that, but I tried. <laughs> well, the first 400 pages, you don't know what the fuck's going on, right? So it's no, just, but I'm those... like, oh, I, I, I like, you know, I like depression and, and competitive tennis. Please, this sounds like it's right up my alley, you know. <laughs> well, I played tennis as well. So that was another piece. Did you play tennis? Um, never well. Okay. I, I, I mean, but I definitely was like, you know, like, you know, spoiled Jewish kid in Encino with, you know, with, with tennis lessons and like my parents always used to make me wear tennis, tennis clothes. That was the, uh, that was the big, uh, even yes. that's a trigger. Um, <laughs> cause they, they would go to Italy for three weeks every year. My first three weeks of school, like even when I was starting a new school, they'd always come back and throw me a Fila sweater <laughs> as kind of a like, Hey, here you go, kid. It was a little like me, Joe throwing the Jersey and the coat right. commercial. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so I always, uh, I always had the latest Borg feel a sweater, but I, I think um, I was, I think I was a better, I was better dressed as a tennis player than I actually, uh, <laughs> than I actually was. Although I, I had a pretty nice 
version of the Tracy Austin backhand, I will say. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but my sport of choice was actually paddle tennis, which was something we played down by the beach here in Los Angeles. Oh, I dig it's that sort sport of, too. It's sort of a four, you know, a, a forebear, is that right? Of what later became pickleball. Correct. They, you know, they sort of have, you know, they, they sort, there are sort of offshoots and now they are competitive sports. But paddle yeah. tennis was my great love. And then ping pong. And ten, I mean, I, I'm pretty known for my hand-eye coordination and I do love my racket sports, but I never, I was never ranked or anything. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I played varsity tennis in, in high school and I played uh, my first year of junior college. So I was a decent player, you know. That sounds uh, great though. But not. I, I got cut. I got cut in high school, so that's <laughs> when I. Well, I got kicked off the team senior year for rampant truancy. But other than that, okay. you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, from but the DFW... know, From what little I know about you, that sounds that sounds in character. <laughs> yes, and, and so like the like DFW thing hit me, <laughs> and the Robin Williams was the one that really knocked me out. So it was, I was on vacation with my family, um, my wife. My two little boys at the time, they were really little. I think Cannon, Cannon is my littlest one. Kingston is my oldest. And I think Cannon was a year old, um, two, maybe two. Um, and Kingston was four. And I remember reading the Robin Williams stuff. And what really pissed me off was everyone saying, how could he kill himself? He's rich. He's famous. He's a coward. Same. How could he do this to his family? I was like, Go fuck yourself. I was so angry. And, and I... I just wrote, and this is one of the first times I just went ballistic on Facebook and, and I've Ooh. kind of done it ever since, <laughs> but I was yeah. just, I, I vented, I was like something to the effect of like, you know, I don't know how many of you guys have dealt with suicide in your life, but unless you have just stop talking, like this is yeah, not you, something you get to talk about, right? Yeah, it's you like, really don't know. you don't no, know. I'm not going to like talk. I can't say things, can't make Jewish jokes. If I'm not Jewish, I can't make black jokes. If I'm not black, right? It's, you can't make, you can't comment on suicide unless you've been a part of it. And you understand it. And so like it was, and I'm not going to get into my own family, but family members also said the same thing. Like, how could he do this? And you're like, I, what? Because he's rich. You, right. Yeah. You know? you've been, like, yes, especially your family members, those that have, you know, but it, just because you've all been through the same sort of stimuli or the same sort of uh, experience, it doesn't mean you process it the same way, no. you no. know, and, and clearly you didn't. Um, but you raised no, I just. Oh, go off. ahead. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. I just go ahead. I said just, I just went off on it because I just couldn't handle the oh, I, vitriol. I online. posted, and I remember posting that day too. I think I posted some different stuff, um, but your your larger point about, and, and this is especially true, I find in any sort of high profile suicide. Yeah. That every time I read and it and I'm I've become very adroit at picking through the code when they say cause of death not yet revealed or yeah, unexpected death I almost always know what that means but yeah. more importantly every time there is a high profile or celebrity suicide at some primal level it feels like my dad just died all over again yeah. because in every case it was a secret that somebody held on to and it's just instantly like it's just it just rips the band-aid off like you think you've healed and i went yeah. through this with robin williams um yeah i'll tell you a story in a second about junior seau but with kate spade and anthony bourdain and Chris Cornell yeah. and Chester yeah. Bennington, and each time it happens, it it just feels so present. And yeah, it's like, like it a just, punch. It's, it's, it's like, like a punch. punch. It's a it punch, really and it feels like, oh my god, I I thought my I thought the wound had healed, but it hasn't healed as much as it did. I, I wanted to mention the Junior Seau one because, like that one in particular, has sort of a special salience in my story one of the issues that comes up in the aftermath of a familial suicide is who do you tell when do you tell and that's especially true when you have children yeah now my kids 
were like nine and five at the time. We made the decision to tell the nine-year-old, my daughter Sammy, and I'm glad we did, as hard as it was, because the next day at school, some kid came running in, hey, I hear your grandpa killed himself. Now, I don't know. Now, I don't know if the kid was aiming to be, you know, cruel by design, but it's it would have been an even crueler res- response had she already not had she not known. True. But we 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 made the judgment call that my five year old was too young that it would be too hard to understand. Neither of them came to the funeral. Um, so then, for for several years, maybe three or four years, like I didn't tell my son. But I knew that he didn't know, and I knew that I knew, and I and so I felt like like my dad's suicide was still a secret up until the time that I would finally tell him, and I didn't know when that was going to be, but it felt imminent. And we were like listening to we were driving just the two of us listening to sports talk radio, um, and they announced that Junior Seau had taken his life. And I, you know, I'm not like a, I'm not a particularly big Chargers fan. I, you know, I prefer the Rams, but I used to live in San Diego briefly. And, um, and I knew what he had meant to that community, for instance. Uh, and I just started welling up listening to it on the radio. And like, I'm sitting, I'm, you know, my eight, nine year old boy is sitting with me and like, you know, not that I'm afraid of having him see me cry, but there is still. Yeah. There is still some, you know, taboos about men crying in front of their sons. And obviously, like, I'm the worst at it because, like, <laughs> you, play, you know, you play a Cat Stevens son song, and you know, or go see Boyhood with him. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, you know, like he has to carry me out of the theater. But like, I, <laughs> the, the, the long story short is that in that moment, I explained to him the reason I was taking it so badly or not, not, not even badly per se, but, but the reason I was reacting so demonstrably was because his grandfather had taken his life too, like Junior Seau. Yep. And, and, and that was, you know, it, it both reopened the wound, served as a trigger, but it also provided a teaching of a teachable moment where I was able to finally come clean. And once I had come clean to him, I felt like I had come clean to everyone who I was like sort of actively keeping it a secret from. And that probably opened the doors for me to start sharing it, you know, with the larger world because I was, I wasn't hiding it from anyone in my own home. So that, I guess that was a good thing, but how did, any, how did Sammy absorb that as a nine year old? Cause I, my little boy is nine and I don't know my oldest little boy. I don't know if mm-hmm. I, if I told him that cause I, my oldest brother, Paul, and he's okay with this. Um, suffers from chronic depression yeah. um, and he wants out. And so he's told us, you know, now he's never told my children um, without my kids, by the way, my brother wouldn't be here. He's made that clear. Um, they have pierced the depressionary layer that has encompassed him for the last 20 years. And wow. as someone who suffers depression episodically, like I, I crawl into these dark holes, yeah. you know, um, I would just say if I had to estimate, it's like three months a year that I'm in the, yeah, I, I'm in the, I'm in the that's hole. That's significant. That's not, but, it, but yeah. I get out, right? I think that's, I think what I'm trying to say there is I get out. My brother has not been able to crawl out for 20 wow. years, which for me, that's like, I get why he wants out. And, and his exit strategy is the Golden Gate Bridge. He's like, if I'm ever gone, that's it. That's where you can find me. And I'm like, all right. So, so let me, so, I mean, that's a great point. And, and one is worth discussing. Like, do you think, do you think in any way that him, his talking about it is a way of not doing it? Yes. You know, and because, because he... in many ways it's, you know, and I've, I've, I've written about this as well, that one of the reasons I write about it is because I don't want to, I don't want that to be me. Right, and I and I I'm in constant fear that it will be, and I think that if I keep talking, and keep yeah. engaging, and keep being honest, rather than holding it in and let shame develop, yep, the you know at least the odds go down. Um, so, as as seemingly bleak 
and macabre as what you just described is, it's healthier than keeping it a secret and then one day jumping off the bridge. I right, think. and he, he didn't tell me this until we wrote the book together. Wow. So it must, so it, there, for it to be two people, two siblings, either having done or wanting to, yeah, there must be something in your family, either genetically or, you yeah. know, or, you know, in the environment, like yep. in the upbringing or a combination, like a volatile I brew, it, like I have. I do think it's similar. And that's, I think why I was so attracted to you, um, even karmically, I was just like, I, I, I can relate to that dude because it's, we have siblings that are, or relatives that are a mess. We have, you know, a suicide in our family. And I, and one thing that I didn't mention is that when Stevie died and I was blubbering over his body, yeah, the first thing I remember feeling was relief. And that freaked me out. And I just started bawling even harder because of that. I felt guilty that I felt relieved. And it was just because every time the phone rang for a decade, at least, you know, from Minnesota, it was my little brother was arrested. He was going to jail. He was, you know, in a car accident. He was, you know, he OD'd, you know, it's just like, and, and there was some level there. And, and I remember thinking with Paul, when he told me this, I said, look, I just want you to know, it'll never be a relief if you go, you know, I don't want you to go. Right. Uh, and he told me that the month before Debbie and I, my wife got married, um, that he was, he was off his meds and he was off his meds because, um, we funded his law firm and he, he felt good about his law firm. And, and then once he got it going, he wasn't making any money. And then he had to ask us for more money. And it was just like this, you know, terrible cycle, um, which I think is very relatable to your pops. Right. I mean, it's like, yeah, for he's sure. a man who's not making it. Right. right. And, and, that's, if, if and you're that's not, how I, yeah. And, and, you know, and I'll, I'll be even more pointed. I mean, that's been me for the last 15 months. You know, I went from running a wildly successful net Netflix sitcom to, I haven't been paid a penny in, in 15 months. And, you know, some of it's pandemic related, but like, yeah. even if you know the circum, even if you can rationalize the circumstances, it doesn't make you feel any more like a man, any more like a provider, any more successful, exactly. you know, and, you know, I try not to judge my own self-worth strictly on how much I make at any given time, but that's also how we measure it in society. Yeah. That in Twitter, that in Twitter followers, thank God for that. <laughs> well, you know, you I, that going for you. you know, if I didn't have the dopamine rush that I got from social media, I don't know what I would do, but I mean, I'm joking, but it's, you know, but there's also some, some truth to what, a lot of truth to what you're saying. And, 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 and even for me to let me go back and respond to your early comment. Like, yes, I do. I have this relative who was not, you know, a relative who, when my mother called me to say they found my father, I misunderstood for the first several minutes and thought they were talking about the other relative. Yes. Because the other relative had tried before. The other relative had constantly been threatening to do it. Right. Um, so that's obvious then. And that's what's so going like, to pop up. Yeah. So like, you know, worst moment of my life, hearing that my father had just hung himself and I'm in the middle of this Abbott and Costello, like, you know, comedy phone bit where it's like, you know, oh, the only thing that could make it worse is that I like, had to make her repeat it six times before I understood the, like the words coming out of her mouth. Uh, How long did it take you to absorb it after you, you figured out it was your dad? What happened? What'd you do? What'd your body do? I think it just collapsed. I mean, I mean, you go into complete shock, at least in my, yeah, I mean, I did too. I, I, you know, I, I, I've written about it. Um, I, and I don't even know if you know this, um, I've started to I've started to write even more extensively about it. I, about two years ago, I wrote about learning about the suicide and the week that followed, building up and, and culminating at the funeral where I was the only one who spoke. Um, I wrote that as a sitcom pilot. Um, you know, obviously it was not, <laughs> obviously it's not meant for CBS on Monday nights at nine, 
but like you know like <laughs> like a, like a dark like a dark tragic comedy on netflix you know yeah. on netflix or showtime right. you know, right. no one bought it but it's you know but it's it is definitely demonstrated a side uh, and the response i've got was odd and a lot of people said to me like wow that's great it doesn't feel like a tv show it feels more like a novel um which is had been sort of the great white whale of my existence wanting to write a book so in in november i wrote it i wrote my first novel um, what do you mean in november you wrote it <laughs> when did you start it like in october like you wrote it in a month because it just came out of me because oh, it was awesome because it was almost all true you know like i changed names i changed october names. of last year no just this just happened yeah 2020 like, like three months ago four months ago like yeah yeah i mean i had written that article about it which was really sort of the template for the uh for the pilot and then i used the pilot as an outline and based on that on the pilot nice of the structure i just started every day writing sort of pre-writing it so then when i actually came down to the physical writing of the book which i had wanted to write a book my entire life and it just seemed yeah like just too much of a burden, like something that like would kill me. I ended up finishing the whole thing within, within three weeks. It's kind Jesus of called these, these, these things don't happen in Encino. Um, but the moments we're talking about are all, you know, sort of versions of them, obviously fictionalized versions, but loosely fictionalized versions in terms of getting the phone call the, yeah. the immediate physical response of shock. <clears throat> I write about the the drive from my house to my parents' house, which is only like 10 minutes away. Um, I write about just the, the, the blur that that was, and then arriving at, the, at your childhood home to discover like it's now a police scene. And like oh, there's geez. yellow tape, and there's like gurneys and detectives and paramedics and fire... I mean, there's like, there's really nothing more disconcerting than like having your home be a crime scene. Um, no, and- I, dude, I can relate there too, because I, I got back from the motorcycle ride and I'm in full leathers, right? <laughs> I mean, boots, p- pants, jacket, I had the helmet off and I still remember the helmet because I had the helmet in my hand when I walked into the bathroom and when I saw him, I dropped the helmet when I screamed and then the helmet rolled like in slow motion all the yeah. way across my hardwood floor. And I just will never forget that. Right. Isn't then, it, I, mean, the, I mean, the images, the images from those moments are as vivid to me 12 years later yeah. as those of this morning. I couldn't tell yeah. you what I had for breakfast, but I could tell you chapter and verse about every feeling and every conversation I had that week. Yeah, as much of a blur as it was, it's just so ingrained in me as like as like sort of like the you know the the primal trauma, you know that you yeah. never you never get over. You don't. And the police, you know, so I called nine one one, and I don't remember the call. That's one thing. I even when we wrote the book, Paul's like, "What did you say?" <laughs> like, I don't fucking remember anything yeah. other than. My brother, you know, I, my brother's dead. Come quickly, you know. I have no way. If, or if I said, you know, I don't yeah. know what I said. But they called, they sent the ambulance. And I remember the paramedics came tearing in the house, three deep, you know, pulling their equipment out. And he was naked on the floor because I pulled him out of the tub. And he was a two hundred pound kid, so he wasn't. The fact that I just, you know, yanked him up, put him on the floor, I gave him mouth to mouth until they got there. And I tasted Tums and wine because he knew he wasn't supposed to be drinking wine. And then he took Tums when he got home because it gives him acidic issues. And so I'll never forget that. And, and then the cops came in and told me it was a crime scene. And they told me to move away from the body and they started interviewing me. And I was like, what the, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, why is this man naked? And I was like, what do you mean? Why is he, do you bathe in clothing, what are you yeah, talking like, about, right? Like, yeah, like I was like, in a wetsuit. What the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> he was like, "Sir, I need you to be calm." And I'm like, "I just fuck off." And I, I started to walk away. And he grabs my chest and he says, "Hey, yeah. you know, this is a crime scene. You need to, you need to calm down." And then it hit me, oh shit! There's a naked dude on the floor. I'm wearing all leathers, and I live in San Francisco. 
Yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> so it was like, oh, I get it, and that's actually what they. And they after we yeah. kind of talked it out, they apologized. And you were holding, you were holding, oh, we your, you were holding your movie tickets from the Castro <laughs> Theater. You just, you exactly. just come back from the. Uh, the they side. thought it was a domestic dispute. Why wouldn't they? I mean, yeah. and I've often thought about that. Like you see these, you see people on these crime shows who are instantly acute, you know, like people grieving and bereaving who are then accused of the crime or, the, or you know, become the primary suspect because they're the spouse. You know, like that's so fucked. But yeah. you also understand why they have to, you know, they have to go through the process. Yeah, like mine, because it did not happen at my my house where I live in, in the family of or in my family's yeah. house, you know, by the time I got there, they, there was, there was its own Michigas, like, and I write about it in the book. I don't even, if I now, I don't even remember if it actually happened or I've just repeated it so many times, you know, in writing, but like, I think I kept using the phrase foul play. Like, you know, like I kept asking anyone like in authority, oh, wow. like, was there any signs of foul play? Like, I don't like, never used that phrase in my whole <laughs> in my whole life i mean like even when i saw the movie foul play and asked for a ticket i don't think i said foul play <laughs> as many times as i did that day it was um but like there's real i mean there's like really weird things like you see like i'm on my driveway of the house i lived in yeah. and i know that like they're cutting <clears throat> my father down from yeah. the rafters in the in the garage like you know just to my left and then and then a gurney comes by with a with a sheet and a body. Yeah. And it's like like literally 30 minutes earlier, I thought he was alive. Yep. And in fact, I thought he'd be alive for another 25 years. This was this was not an yeah. old man. I mean, he was okay, yeah. he was 75. I don't know. His dad lived in 93. Like, like you go from not knowing there's a death to having to like process all of it. In, like, in such rapid fire motion, it, it really yeah. is hard for the brain to take it all in. And I think one of the greatest things my wife ever did for me, you know, in addition to marrying me and, and, li and, and keeping me around all these years, is um, the paramedics asked me if, they, if I wanted to see the body once before they took it away. Mm. And she answered for me. She's like, no, no, he, he, he doesn't. And, and I think that was, you know, in a week where there were so many traumas that she spared me from, you know, what would have been just one too many. And I think I would agree. I, I mean, I think that there's two schools of thought there. But for me, uh, I still remember the zipper of the body bag. I remember that in my apartment. I remember him putting on the gurney and I remember him wheeling him out. And I remember the coroner saying, if you have any questions or concerns, call me. And he left me his card. And I was like, all right, you know, like I have to get his body back to Minnesota. <laughs> How do I do that? And, and he said, just call me tomorrow. And then they tried to get people to come. My brother was in Hawaii um, on a gymnastics. He's a coach. And so I called him and I said, hey, Paul, you know, Stevie's dead. And he, uh, and I said, you got to call mom because I can't. I just, I can't hear her wail. And I knew yeah. she would. And he, she did. You know, so my brother had to live through that, which but he, I told he took him. one for the team. On he that took one. it. And I love him for that. I said, dude, I just can't handle anymore right now. Like you need to call mom. And that's exactly what she did. She, you know, that's why I asked it. She just screamed and she fell to her knees and, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear it. Thank God. Cause it's like, I didn't have that. I didn't so have, you, that. Uh, you know, our experiences are very, are very similar. They point towards the larger experience, which is even in this, even in the midst of this like great existential tragedy, how much of it becomes logistics. And yeah. Like, yeah. You know, like I, you know, in, in my novel, I, uh, there's a whole chapter of where like an hour later I'm sent off with my parents old phone book where they still had, you know, like, you know, <laughs> and everything written and scrawl, you know, like, yeah. you know, and, and having a call, in blue yeah. pen. In blue pen. It's like crossed <laughs> out, like, you know, what, what, yeah. what, you know, when two and three became eight, one, eight, you know, like, but I had to like, then like, I had to call, I remember sit, and I'm sitting on the floor on the carpet in my parents' bedroom with a phone. Like I was like a teenage girl, like in a, in oh, a rom-com 
you know, like calling <laughs> on a pink phone. Yeah, a pink phone, like you know, because <laughs> you live in Encino. <laughs> <laughs> it's not out of the question, but I, um, having to call like you know, all of my mother's siblings and her yeah. mother, and I had to call. Oh, this is awful! I had to call my dad's younger sister, you know, who yeah. just idolized him and still does, and I had to call the best man at his wedding and I had to call the man who had set that my parents up, you know, over 30 years earlier. And it's like, there's just no, and I wrote a lot about the experience of, of sort of rolling those calls because like, you feel like shit anyway, but then you yeah. feel like shit doubly because you have the knowledge that they don't have. And you know, within a second, you're going to ruin their day and their week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and feel and shitty about it. <laughs> and you try to like, you really have to weigh the, do I tell them he died or do I tell them he died by suicide or do I step it out and let them ask? So there's all those sort of calculations that like, you're like an hour ago he was alive. And now I'm like talking to you know, and it's like, as I say in the book, these are people like many of whom I had not seen since my bar mitzvah. Yeah. So uh, it's like, hey, it's Brian Bihar. Like, that's right. You gave me uh, the cross pen and pencil set. Very good. <laughs> um, funny. Right. Another funny story. Yeah. I mean, there's just right. no, there's no segue. Okay. You know, there's no, <laughs> there's no elegant segue. No. There's no, there's no easy way to do it. But like, there's so many things you you have to do in the immediate aftermath that require you to just to suck it up. Like when you talked about like. How do I get the body back to Minnesota? Well, in our family, it, it became, first it was burial versus cremation. And who's going to pay for it? I hadn't yeah. worked in like close to a year at that point because there had been a writer's strike in 2007, 2008. So I had no money. My mother just learned that she had no money. Right. Like she thought she was rich up until, uh. you know, an hour earlier, like, yeah. you know, like I, I, like I've said, like I say in the book and I've said probably some of the articles that you've read, like, like I thought my parents were not just doing fine, but were doing great. Like they had gone to China twice in the previous year. And as I always say, who the fuck goes to China twice in a year, unless you're a lesbian <laughs> adopting a baby or Marco fucking Polo. I said like Nixon went to China once and Nixon's famous for going to China. Right, that's true. You know, like, so, like, in my mind, like, I can't, I can barely pay my mortgage, and they're going to China. Like, I don't know why they're not giving me money. Now, in retrospect, they're not giving now me money you know. because they've been out of money for five years, and I didn't know that, and neither did my mom. But, Oof. so, we're, we're trying to figure out whether, you know, so, like, first we're going to bury the body, and then that's, like, a, a massive cost. But we've already sent the body to you know, to, to Hillside, the, you know, the, uh, the crematorium the, or the, well, not the crematorium. Then we're like, Oh, we need to get it back. Let's, let's cremate him. And, but they, the body's already been sent. So it's somewhere out there. Oh, so like there's some weekend at Bernie's set piece going on on the 405. <laughs> we're like trying to get like, get a bot. I mean, like, and you so you're dealing with like this, <laughs> both this immense grief and like this total idiocy. Oh my God. You know, so like both, and it's you know, you, both of those things can can exist side by side, and that's sort of a lot of what the book ultimately is about. You know, like this real side by side of the sacred and the profane in the days in the days that follow. Because I'm so naive, I expected everyone in the family to behave on their best behavior. Like, you know, fuck, I wrote Fuller House for five years. You know, I'm used to. <laughs> People coming to you know, family, like, yes. like good, 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 good Goya, good Christians coming together yes. and pitching in, and you know, in the aftermath of death, and you know, forming this ad hoc new family. Like that's that wasn't my family. My family was like the Jewish Adams family. Like, it, <laughs> like, like I always say, like we made uh, August Osage. We made uh, the Teletubbies look like Osage Osage Osage. <laughs> August Osage County uh, is the <laughs> name of the play. Like, you know, like it, 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 it couldn't have stirred up more dysfunction and, and more animosity and like 
age old wounds playing out, but like I always defend them to an extent, they're not characters in a play. Right. They're they're like other people like me who just lost the most important person in their life. And like Right. And everyone it, deals with it differently. Everyone right? deals with it differently. Now, it doesn't mean it made it any easier on me that like I felt I couldn't grieve properly because I was having to be a referee in the family, but that's how they were grieving. So I cut them, you know, <clears throat> I cut them slack in that respect. Although I still wrote a book about it. So Well, and that's so you're, where are you with the book? You said it's done. Are you now putting it into, are you giving it to an agent or what's the next step? Well, yeah, I gave it to my TV people. I, I Honestly, I don't know what the next step is because I, it, it all happened so quickly and I'm really not of that world. But I gave it to my TV people who said they would give it to some book agents that they know. So I'm waiting for, for feedback. So I have yet to like go through the like the sending notes. out query letters and, right. you know, I'm like, oh my God, I have to be able to summarize what the book was about. I don't know what it was about. I just wrote it. <laughs> like, but well, it, it, it's going to be a whole new process that I'm unaware of, but it's it's exciting at least. It but, is. And I can tell where you, you, where are you, where are you I, in the process? My book will be published on February 15th this year. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's almost done. So you went through. Um, you found a publisher. And I did agent. not even look for a publisher or did, an did agent. Did you self-publish it? Yes. Or? Yes. Um, I can, I can I do that? Oh, of course, and I can rock you through every piece of oh, part okay. of it. Um, the, just to get into that, so I I talked to a couple uh, high powerful like agents and and publishers, and one of them even read a couple of the chapters just. And she said, this isn't a typical ad guy book. <laughs> and I, you know, I read, I was in the advertising business for 20 yeah, years. Like, what do they want? Ogilvy on advertising? Like, you know, well, or- she made a joke that a lot of ad guys getting out of the business, like I was at the time, yeah. they write about themselves and they, it's like, I'm pretty awesome. And it's a, it's a memoir, right? Yeah. Memoirs about insecurity and, and, and but like what ad books have there been other than that? It's yeah, very you're right. I, you know? None of them have been good. Let's just say that. I think that was kind of her point. And she said, so I, you know, if you want to go through the process with us, here's what you need to do, right? Which was exactly what you're talking about. Some reason, then you have a year. If they accept the book, then you work with them for a year on their notes. Yeah. And then from that, you know, you keep, they regurgitate it back. And then they'll, they'll say things like, you know, we think, we think your audience is this, right? So we need you to tweak the book this way or to remove this scene or to rewrite this chapter or whatever it was. Um, and I didn't feel like going through all of that. So I, my brother is a, um, he's never written a book, but he has a master's degree in English composition and rhetoric, and he has a law degree, and he teaches uh, legal reasoning and writing in law school, right? And so he's, he's a gymnastics coach? He did gymnastics all the way through his academics. So okay. he taught, he taught as a coach. Very good. Um, and I so he's wanted, a- I, I just wanted to prove to you that I was listening. <laughs> I appreciate that. So he, I, I wrote the first- I don't know, five drafts, if you will. And then I handed it to Paul, my brother. And I said, you know, can you help me with this? Is this, is this, is this anything, you know, to quote Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. And uh, he said, with my help, we can publish this. Great. And that was, you know, two years ago. So then we started sitting on the couch together every Sunday, Monday, um, and he would write and I would write. And then I'd hand him my week's worth of work. And he'd, you know, he'd sit back up and say, okay, um, do you hate the reader? And I'm like, no, I don't hate the reader. <laughs> he's like, well, you can't write this. And here's, come here. <laughs> so I'd go over and he'd say, look, this whole sentence is redundant. And this, this is a great sentence. I'd never carried anyone's bags before. It's when I was writing about being a caddy. And he goes, that's a great sentence. But all the shit around it is shit. Rewrite it. I'm like, all right. So then no, I rewrite good. it. I mean, and, and I've gone through the sort of the, the opposite experience, which is I've had, a, I've had, a writing partner for 25 years, but now I'm writing this on my own. So I don't know. I don't know if it is shit. Um, <laughs> well, did he look at it? No, 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 no on okay. my own, on my own. This is all me. But you haven't um, even had him read it. No. Okay. So um, I, I went through all that and then I hired an actual editor, like a, prof- and a friend of Brad Barron's. It was Brad's wife who owns that publishing company. Introduced me to this n- nice young lady uh, Des Houston, who I absolutely adore. She 
she gave me 24 pages of notes. Really? So it was a lot of work. She did oh, a lot no. of you deconstruction. Mean have, you mean I might have to do more? Oh, dude, you're going to have a lot more. There's no question. Even if but, I self-publish it? Even if I just throw it out? Uh, I, I don't think you're the kind of guy that's going to want to put a book out that hasn't been no, critiqued, that's true. right? That's true. Um, so yeah, you got a lot more work. And, and I think that the big piece there is that you have, um, you have a third party neutral that comes in and says, you know, this character is not developed. Like I actually opened up the, the first pair, the first uh, chapter with Stevie's funeral. And then I got into his death, like finding him. And she said something that I'll never forget, which was, because my prologue is like, you know, present night 2014, I'm driving through San Francisco in my stupid, expensive car, going to pick up my kids at private school, you know, all the douchey stuff. Yeah. And then chapter one was when we talked about the funeral. Right. And then we went into my brother's death and she said, look, no one knows who Stevie is, right? And the death is a shock. It's like the, it, it whiplashes the reader back and forth. And then in chapter two, you start with your family story, like back in Minnesota in 1970. Eight, and it's a really cute, quaint beginning yeah. to your life. But like you, you've jostled your reader, and and we don't have any actual emotional uh, relationship with Stevie yet, and we don't know anything about you. So you need to kind of factor that in. And so because of that, we actually took and put the actual death into a linear path within the book, wow. and we kept the funeral scene. But then we actually um, took chapter twenty four, which was a whole stuff about Stevie's drug abuse and his yeah. decades of alcoholism. And we put it into chapter one, which then the reader got to understand, Oh, it's cool. And then to your Facebook, Twitter stuff, she said, there will be people that accuse you of using Stevie's death. Yes. This book. Right. And I was like, Oh right. yes, I'm already, Yeah. People don't even know what my book's about. They're already accusing me. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, I never even thought of that. And, and so the, the thing that was cool. And then, Another thing I want to just wrap into this is that I was a managing director and partner at an ad agency um, for the last 10 years of my career. And it was awesome. It was one of the most amazing yeah. runs I've ever had. I call it my Seinfeld run. Um, we were the ad agency of the year, 2011, 2012. My partners and I shot a documentary called The Naked Brand. Wow. It was all about how social technology was going to alter brand communication moving forward. And I went on this keynote speaking to her and, and I was speaking at conferences and I was just loving it, right? The whole thing. Yeah, it sounds like you're living the dream. It was great. Um, and then we had babies and, you know, I was on a, I was on the plane a hundred thousand miles a year, every year for a long time. Um, I was the pitch guy. So I was at, I was out getting new business all over. I spent a lot of time in New York city. Uh, we had an office there as well. And so when we got I think it was after Kingston was born and actually with both of my kids were born. Um, my partners and I were at a crossroads with where we wanted the agency to go. And I decided to take a job offer from a startup that wanted me to come and run uh, their startup because it had something to do with advertising. It was a technology play for ad tech and I won't bore you with what it meant, but I got there and uh, five months after I left my, my partnership at an agency, they ran out of money. Um, yeah. And when they hired me, they told me, um, you know, we, we closed the term sheet. We got two years in the bank. You know, we need you to go out and get this business. And so I brought in two of my best like mates um, and I hired them and we, we had this team and we started going up to New York and selling this really cool service. And then like a lot of startups, you know, it just, it ran out of money. And so I came back and I'm watching Curious George with my kids sure. and I'm now I'm jealous about the man in the yellow hat because he's got a fucking house in you know yeah. Manhattan. It's a job. And, <laughs> and no job and a house in Manhattan and then either a house in the Berkshires or, you know, <laughs> the Hamptons or wherever he had. And he's got he's a doing, yellow convertible. He's doing very well. <laughs> he's killing it. And he's not worried about anything. He's got a monkey. No, he's got Jack, he's got a Jack Johnson <laughs> soundtrack. He does. He's got a he's and yes, the Jack down. Johnson. I took my kids three times. I we went three weeks in a row saw it in the theater on three consecutive Saturdays and then bought the soundtrack and then fell asleep to the soundtrack for a year. Us too. Us too, yeah. man. My kids that's, love Curious George. We read it to him every night. And then we, you know, we watched the Lorax and we watched about how they're, you know, cutting down all the trees and killing the world. And, you get, and so I just remember your kids. 
So like, well, this is another thing I'm just trying to get to is that I did that. I went to another startup. They ran out of money in nine months. Then I went to another startup, um, which was started by three uh, sustainability scientists. Very cool play. They wanted to introduce like um, conscious consumers. So people that cared about a product, like if your, your sweater was made sustainably, right? There was something environmental or socially or ethically um, responsible about it. And they wanted to build this company based on that. And I thought this is perfect. And so I talked to my wife and I said, I'm not going back to advertising. I'm going to do this. This is going to satisfy my soul. I'm going to help the world. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And that was cool. The CEO was a young man who I still love. And, um, it, and I, they just closed the doors, I think six months ago, but um, I left three years ago. And I said to my wife, I'm like, babe, I gotta, I gotta figure out all this failure. Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I don't well, want to go, I don't want to go back. Fa- is it failure? I mean, well, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting to you, dude, is that. Well, let's, let's talk about it because. Well, it's ask, not. Ask your question because, or, or a career trajectory is just, is nonlinear now. It's not. Well, exactly. It's not, you know, the man in the gray flannel suit. You're not going to get a, you know, a company watch after serving, you know. Nope you know, you know, working at Xerox for 40 years. I mean, that's just <laughs> like, well, let, let me give you, let me give you an example. May I? May yeah, I, jump in? I don't know that you know this about me. Maybe you do. Cause you seem pretty like almost crazily well-versed in my background, <laughs> but I don't know if you knew that but my first seven years out of Brown were a spent copywriter. as a copywriter in the ad game. And in fact, yep. my last two years were, were, were two, my two favorite years up as a San Francisco ad guy, just like yourself. Oh, I, uh, wait, what firm? What shop? Um, now I might be three times your age, so this might be this might be showing we're the same age. Uh, <laughs> I was at. Are we? Oh, then, yeah, then, I'm fifty four. Then, then, uh, I think I you're a year older than me. Oh, but yeah. I'm 54. So oh, yeah. I turned 55 a, a week ago. Okay. Yeah, happy belated. I saw that on Facebook. Oh, okay. So happy, oh, okay. happy thought, belated. Because uh, you're, you're throwing out all these terms that didn't exist when I was in it. So like, like digital. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or internet. But yeah, digital I, uh, wasn't there. So I, I worked at Citron Helligman Bedecare as a senior copywriter. They, they, these guys were a, uh, like had been a very recent spinoff from Hal Reine. Ah, okay. And, and they were Ad Week West Coast Agency of the Year. Yeah. And they were a big giant write up in, you know, in Communication Arts Magazine. Um, you know, they, they were a little more designy than like I, you know, I just want to write jokes and write joke headlines, you know, yeah. but like, but like a, like a very, like hit, hit a hundred million in billings, like when I was there and like only after a couple of years of like a real, like a real hot shit place. That I'd always the kind of place I always wanted to work at. In fact, yeah, I had I had spent the previous four and a half years at Ketchum. Oh yeah, in uh, in LA, doing almost nothing but Acura. Oh, you know, okay. I did so much car stuff that like I couldn't get out of LA because yeah. I only had car stuff to show. So then I get up to San Francisco, and and, and there's a reason I'm telling it the long version. So I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> it's all good. So I get up there and it's like heaven. It's it, it's you know it's this brick building on Front Street. You know, yep. Goodby's right across the street from us. Yep. And you know, like the creative department is in is literally in a like a loft with exposed beams and and brick, and like we just like you know no offices. And I was I was twenty nine and I was like the geezer of the bunch. Yeah, that's old. <laughs> and I lo- and I loved it, and like you know, within you know, within like a a month of being there, I sold these two spots and we shot them with Joe Pitka, and they won the Clio, and nice. I and I received my Clio from Cisco and Ebert. Not that that's going to date the story at all, but like <laughs> everything that I had wanted, I was achieving. I was hanging out with cool with people who are far cooler than me. These like super hipster San Francisco design types, yep. winning awards, and I was like, and I'm still not happy because all I ever wanted to do was write sitcoms, but I was too terrified to ever do it. Um, so for seven years from bet- between college and the end of my stint of 
at Citroen Hallingman, I spent seven years trying to write a spec script to break into, into sitcoms. But I was like, oh, I can't do that. That's, what, that's only what other people do. That's what talented people do. So I never finished a script. And then finally, a guy I went to college with, a guy in my fraternity, is like, hey, I'm, I'm writing a script with someone else. I'm like, what, what the fuck? You can't do that. That's my dream. You've never <laughs> mentioned it. Like, get rid of the other person. We're going to do it. We, we, we did it by fax. We wrote one script. Within, within a month, we were on Ned and Stacy. And I, you know, I quit my ad job, but like it took, and here's where, where it's a little counterintuitive. It took having a great ad job to make me realize I didn't want to do advertising anymore. Um, had I just done four and a half years at Ketchum, you know, like do, you know, like double, you know, anti-lock brakes, you know, dual, <laughs> you, know, pa- yes. you know, driver and passenger side, everybody, just writing that over and over. I wouldn't have known whether I truly liked advertising in its best form. When I went to San Francisco, I loved the people. I loved the feeling of it. I would go to Grumpy's every Friday and hang oh, out man. with, you know, like with me the, too. Like, you know, and, and San Francisco is such an good ad, cheeseburger, a great <laughs> cheeseburger. But you know, I'm I will have three of the second I get off this call just to quell my nerves. But um, <laughs> but like. It was important to do it in its best form and say, like, that's great. I, like, that's what advertising is when it's done how you want to do it. But I still have other aspirations and dreams I need to pursue. And so, like, I don't view my seven years in advertising as a waste, but I think people are shocked. I mean, at the time, that felt like a lifetime, seven years, like, because those were the only seven years I had as an adult. Now in the grand scheme, after 25 right. years of TV, nobody even, you know, even close friends don't know I was ever even in advertising. So it's all just part of like this tapestry we're weaving together. You know, every every little, you know, every dot on the on their trajectory has some meaning or reason that I, I believe that gets you to the next place. So well, I mostly, to, said- I, I mostly wanted to say that I was in advertising, and that's why I was talking about Jerry Delafonte. <laughs> well, take your own advice there, because that's what I was getting to when I was saying that I went to these startups that didn't work. Yeah. I then told my wife I'm going to write a book about my huge ego, and I didn't know what that looked like. Yes. And as I, I had kind of an Anthony Bourdain in mind with, I don't know if, I'm sure you've read his books, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you look at, his writing style, it was very, I mean, he's a brilliant writer to start with. Um, yes. Yeah, to think the Kitchen, kitchen Confidential Kitchen like, Confidential was just out of hand. just knocked out. Yeah, yeah like, like you did, right? So I'm not a writer. Yes, I'm, so, a, yeah. I'm a storyteller, and so it took me a lot longer to get going on it, and I had to learn how to write, and then my brother had to come in as a co-author and clean it up, because otherwise it was unreadable. And the reason I share that with you is that I spent the last three years turning down job offers that my wife told me to turn down because as I was writing, I became a coach. I coached my little boys, um, on three teams. I coached their soccer, their baseball and their basketball. I drove them to school every day. I picked them up every day. I play with them every day. I put them to bed every night and now they're nine and seven and it's, they're going to be boys like in three, four years, they're going to be on their teams with their dudes and I'm, I'm going to be out of the picture. And so it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me was this perceived failure of these startups not working and then me not figuring out what do I want to do with the rest of my life. And that's kind of where this whole platform I'm came from. I'm not hearing you. We're freezing up a little. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? No. I can hear you now, but... Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were starting to go a little Max Headroom on me for a second. Oh, sorry. No, so it's good it, now? Okay. Yes. So but, uh, I don't no, know where I lost but, you. But, but, but no, I, I heard you say that you, you got this invaluable time with your kids that you ordinarily yeah. would have never had. Yeah. And you were you know, able to turn seemingly a, 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 a dark time into a blessing, which is hard to, it's hard to recognize that at the time. Well, and that's what I'm asking you. So yes. you, you've been I, off for 15 months. And if you weren't off, if you were still running a 200 person organization as a yes. runner, 
would yeah, you have had the time to write your book? Oh my God, never. All right. I would have never done it. So same thing, dude. All I'm saying is that we have a lot of similarities in our lives. Yeah, and no, for some shit, yeah. The fact no, that we're both sitting gonna, home. I was going to wear a black t-shirt, but I, didn't, I thought I had to... I thought I had to at least give the veneer of, of being fancy. <laughs> this, so I found the one sweater from college I have left and then ready to go. Um, I, you have to wear a black t-shirt when you're in advertising. So it's all I have. I have black. Yeah, no, I, 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 well, I, I'm in my bedroom here. I can take out my stack. I still have my <laughs> stack of black pocket tees from the gap from, uh, you know, from nineties advertising. Because there you go. That's all I needed. Um, it's all you no, wear. It's all I really no, need to wear. Your point is well taken. And I don't really have the um, the distance yet to see it. Um, all I see is I'm out of money, yeah. and what am I going to do? And do I have to do I have to take my pension early? But like the truth is, if I look at the the scope, you know, if, if I'm able to look at this whole period from a from a more macro place and say like, oh wow, I sold the book. Or I have a book being published and I'm starting a second one. Like, I don't know if that's happening yet <coughs> because I'm, I'm in the middle of this chapter. Right. And that's hard to do. And, and it's, it's a real skill to have the ability to sort of, and I try really hard. I try to like sort of see value in every moment and, and not beat myself up as much as I once would have. Um, but yeah, it's tough. It's tough when you're a grown man. Stuff when you're 55 and you don't have a job and you know you you have a family of four depending on you and you have um you know one kid finishing college and another about to start next year and you don't know how you're gonna pay for it. You know, like these are all things that people don't like to talk about, but like no. I can't be the only one going through it. Well, yeah. you're not, and I think that's kind of why I wanted to start this platform, not just the book, but this. I want to yeah. interview folks like you that I respect, that I think, you know, I mean, I think you're a mensch. I think what you've done in your history is awesome. I think the fact that you can be so vocal about insecurity speaks to your strength as opposed to the opposite. And I think that that's something where, you know, that was what was interesting in this conversation because the coping mechanisms for me are probably different. Um, but one thing we have in common, and I did this over the last three years quite a bit, was binge eat. Oh, great. So yes. When I get really fucked up, like I'm feeling emasculated, you know, like I, my wife is supporting me, right? She's supporting my family. And, and she's like, I don't know why that's a problem for you. Like, that's just so male. That's just so lame. And she's like, I got this. Go do your thing. It's going to be fine. Right. And I'm like, all right, all right. And that's and, a great support system to have exist. Like, it's well, it's I'm so fortunate because she's a big yeah. executive and she has a great job. And so we don't have money problems, which I and I've been broke numerous times. So I'm with you. I feel that. Yeah. And and you know, I like my Cobamex are weed and and weed is a is good yeah. for my anxiety. But then once I get on the weed and yeah, the one get, thing get, you, get me to the cheeseburgers. Well, if, <laughs> if it was just cheeseburgers, it'd be one thing. It's you mentioned in one of your articles that most of your eating takes place after everyone else goes to bed and before they get up. Right. Yes, it was and, between the hours of it's it's between the hours of everyone's asleep and someone's awake. That's it. That was what you said. I, I'm gonna I go tweet that too, by the way. If that's not if if that doesn't get retweeted, then I don't know what. Oh no. <laughs> if it's not about Trump, nobody gives a shit. I can write anything and no one cares. And if I and if I slammed and if I slam Trump, then you get lots of likes. I get then I get the likes. <laughs> so I know where my bread and butter is. But uh well no, because that that's another thing too. I was talking with a young lady. This is before COVID and she was having a hard time interviewing. And so she talked, my friend was like, talk to my friend, Joey. And she's like, why? And she goes, he'll just help you. And so we sat down and we talked and I said, what do you do for your anxiety? And she was bubbling. Like she was sitting next to me and we were at this, this restaurant downtown and I could feel her anxiety. Right. And I said, sure. look, I said, I'm not interviewing you. She said, I know. And I said, just, just go like this. <laughs> she's like, what? I said, just, just shake your shoulders. And she's like, why? And I'm like, sweetie, I, I know we're here to talk about you interviewing. And if this is what's happening in an interview, you're never going to get a yeah, job. Really so you got to chill out. And then she starts, okay. And then I said, look, what do you do? Do you, do you drink wine? No. I'm like, do you smoke weed? She's like, no. And I'm like, 
do you eat? And she goes, yes. Good. I said, all right, good. So let's talk about that. I said, like, can you laugh at yourself about your eating? She goes, no. And I said, okay, I can. So let me ask you this. What's the most amount of food you shoved down your gullet in the last month? And she starts laughing. And I was like, so okay. And, and so she, and then it, it got her going. And then she, and she didn't talk, but she laughed. I said, all right, I'll tell you how much I ate two nights ago. <laughs> and I went into it and it was, she started laughing because it was, I think I put a whole pizza in the oven after yeah. I went to bed. And while the pizza was in the oven, I, I have this thing about cheese. So I, I take out these little, you know, Tillamook squares and I put peanut butter on them and I roll them up. So they're like little burritos with cheese in them. And so I'm sitting there standing over the sink, eating my fucking cheese and, and peanut butter as my pizza's cooking. And then yeah, I'm like, oh, I mean, what, what any, else is in any, the fridge? By the way, any story in which you're eating anything over the sink is already, <laughs> you're already like veering into some like dangerous territory, you know? But that's well, because I've read if you if you eat it over the sink, it doesn't count. There's no calories, <laughs> right? So yeah, there's no, that. I, I remember that from Weight Watchers. <laughs> yes, yeah, me so too. That's, 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 that's their number one thing: eat over the sink, and it doesn't. And over the holidays, or uh, or after two in the morning. Well, and that was part of the idea for me was that this whole platform of you know laugh laugh your cry out, which is what I want to do with my friends, yes, no, you, and everyone else. Yeah, is that if we can start to laugh at ourselves, right? It, it's a, it's the beginning of healing, right? So it's one of those things where sure. it, it's, and you laugh at yourself constantly. And I think that's another reason that I was so uh, enamored with your writing and kind of who you are. Obviously I'm getting to know you, but is, has humor always been your thing? No. You know? I mean, that's a, like, that's a, that's a great question. Like, you know, I don't know if Brad told you anything of what he I was told like. told me anything, I, actually. He, just, he doesn't he, know shit about... No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> but, um, no, but I mean, like, I was, like, preternaturally shy in elementary school. That much I gathered. In, and, and middle school. You know, I, you know, in retrospect, I'm not sure that sending me to an all-boys... I'm not sure that sending a shy, sensitive, fragile Jewish boy to an all-boys Episcopalian formerly military prep school was, you know, was, was the right move, you know, but it happened and I didn't talk. And like, I was so bullied as an eighth, in eighth grade, I was so bullied by this one guy. Thanks, Mark Finucchi. Um, <laughs> he might actually watch this. So th actually, thanks. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but like I was bullied in eighth grade for not speaking. And, every, and so he spread the rumor that I was this drug addict. And everyone, so everyone in the grade is like, oh, you're a drug addict, drug addict. Drug addict in eighth grade. Yeah. So then <laughs> the irony, you know, these kids were not, like, their, their skill was not necessarily ironic thinking. The same exact people senior year would then make fun of me because I wasn't a drug addict. Right. <laughs> uh, like, oh, fuck, what a kook. He's sober. Like, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't smoke weed. Like, you know, so. What a square. <laughs> what a square. So um, I, and I came from a family where, like, for whatever other um, strange dynamics it may have had and may continue to have, it was not a place where, like, I spoke a lot. I kept to myself. It was it was safest for me that way. So I had no idea that I was funny. It was not something that I valued or prized. In ninth grade we had to write a speech as part of like mandatory speech class. And I just remember I wrote it. It could be about any topic. So I wrote it about the show Dallas. I brought in all these props. Wow. I, I brought in this like fake gun, you know, like to reenact the shooting of Jr. Now I would have been like arrested for bringing a gun onto campus, yes. but people were howling. And I was like, like, like I honest, like truly, like I had that moment of like, wait, are you laughing at me? Or, like, is right. are, is pig's blood next? Like, is this, are, are we doing Gary or, and like, you know, from that, I started to like do speech a lot for four years. And like, you know, I was terrible at debate because the, the conflict scared me. Mm -hmm. I tried it. Uh, but writing, writing my own speeches and like delivering comedy speeches 
Yeah. I, I went to like state championships my senior year. And then when I got to Brown, like, wow. But like, I still was super shy around the people at school. Like there are a lot of people who like, wait, you went to our, you went to my school. And like, and it was not a big school. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then my first day at Brown, there was some talent show for the entire freshman class, 1200 people. I had no act. I had not thought about it. I hadn't signed up. I fucking just jumped. I was a little wasted. I just jumped on stage and started doing this stand-up routine. Stand-up. About, about the Brady Bunch. About, like, I started reenacting episodes and singing Holy the song. Shit. And then for four years, everybody knew me as the Brady Bunch guy. And then from that, I started... Because, <laughs> like, I was pretty sure I was there to be, uh, you know, like a corporate attorney like everyone else yeah. I knew from high school. <laughs> and I submitted an article to the Brown Daily Herald and got picked as a columnist. And, and I was like, wow. wow, like I didn't even, like this is not a skill that I knew I even had. So I did that for three years. So like by the time I graduated, I knew like I had to write for a living and I had to be funny, but I didn't have the, cur what I wanted to do was write sitcoms. That's all I never wanted to do, but I didn't have the courage. I'm like, oh, that's for people with talent. So I'm going to go into advertising. <laughs> Um, That's what everyone does. No, 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 guys, everyone calm down. No, um, <laughs> but I had taken a class at UCLA over one summer, like an extension class in, in copywriting. I was like, wait, you can get paid for this? And so I, for a year after college, and it was a really hard year because all my other friends were at law school. And I took a class, in, you know, I was taking copywriting classes, putting a portfolio together. But I did it. I got hired, you know. Got hired a year later. My first job was in San Diego. Then I got hired up in Ketchum in L.A. Like I said, went up to San Francisco and yeah. did a full seven years. You know, did the whole, ad, you know, award circuit, all that kind of stuff. And um, But I, I could never shake the fact that what I really wanted to do was write comedy. And, like, I got some solace and some, you know, affirmation from writing, you know, kind of funny TV spots or funny headlines. But it wasn't, it wasn't the ultimate goal. And like, what's funny is once you're in TV, you're like, oh my God, this is so hacky. I can't believe I have to write sitcoms. Why am I not a novelist? You know, like, right. you know, like. Well, that's the Seinfeld joke, right? The, the sitcom writers. And George's like, I didn't know you're a writer. He goes, I'm not a, what a writer. What's a sitcom? Writer, I'm not a writer sitcom. <laughs> well, you know, but, like, but, but like, for so long, I died to write. I would die to write sitcoms. I, I used to tell myself, if I get on one staff, I can die happily because I made it and I got over my biggest fear. And then you do one. And then, and that was a really bad experience. And like the people were incredibly mean and, and my anxiety was off the charts. And I was like, oh my God, I really fucked this up. I had a very stable job where I was well liked yeah. in San Francisco. The place is growing. They eventually, like a year later, they. But, Citron Halligman became AKQA, which I think was yep. became a, like a big digital Massive success. Shop. Oh yeah! And like so, like I would have been part of that. Yeah. And instead, I was like a guy like shit. I almost got fired in my first month on a, on the sitcom because <laughs> I took a chance. I'm like, should should I not like it? Like it affirmed all of my fears. I'm like, should I not have taken a chance? It sounds a lot like a lot of the sort of the startups you went into, but like. I pushed through. They were going to fire me after my first script. Somehow they gave me a second script that was a lot better. And he's like, yeah, you can, we'll, we'll keep you around. We wrote four scripts that year and then just kept getting hired year after year until you look up and you're like, wow, I've been doing this for 25 years. I have no savings, but <laughs> puzzle job, you know, let her run. Well, I mean, because the, the, the fact that you went up on stage was my kind of my next question. You obviously didn't want to be a stand-up, right? You just wanted to see um, if you could do it. Yeah. I, I mean, I had not even, I don't even think I had given it that much thought. But Did you do it ever but, again? But, 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 well, that's, okay. To your point, I have a twofold answer. Number one, <laughs> in, college, I, in college, I tried it two more times. Okay. And in both times, and this is Brown, which is more PC and sensitive than any place on earth, you know, and that includes the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> somebody was deeply offended by something I said. It's, and it's not, 
it's not like I was dice clay. I was still right. like, I was still me, you know, like, hey, hey, you need the money. No, 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 cut that out. No, um, but like, there wasn't a woman who lived in a shoe. Yeah, no, no, no. You, you, you get yourself in trouble. You, you can't say you're not a douchebag if you quote dice clay. But like, both times like were really traumatic in terms of, I told my senior year, I, I, I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try sit. I'm going to try stand up. I, I did it once. Some woman was offended at, at, at a joke I had told. And then, by the way, did at anything, a comedy club. Um, no, it was in a lounge on at campus. Brown, on campus. Okay. Yeah. It, that's my, different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was on campus. Was it like, it was like insensitive, but it, it wasn't even about women. It was like, there was a guy on campus who had a long, a big mole that had long hairs growing out of it. <laughs> so I did all these bits about like this guy. It was that he was so cool that like, you could like, you know, do dreadlocks with the hair, and you know that I saw him wearing a yarmulke on his mole. Like it was, it was not <laughs> nice per se, but it wasn't right. like, it wasn't like really like othering anyone. But she wrote a long article in the Brown Daily Herald saying how insensitive I was to the handicapped. Okay. Handicap because of yeah. a mole. You had a mole. Okay, so, so you have to buy that. You have to buy it's brown in 1988, and that's what people do. So then I don't think anything of it. I mean, and, until I get a call from the police. The brown oh. police need to see me. Jesus. Apparently someone called this woman and harassed her on the phone. Oh. So and naturally, you. so naturally, she accused me. Right. It wasn't me, but she said it was. And according to the Brown police, that was enough. Even though she taped the call and the voice wasn't mine. So I went from, yeah, three weeks before graduation, I was almost kicked out of Brown. So Jesus. So like <laughs> So the thing is, so like, here's the, here's the problem. I'm someone who like deep, deep down, I hear the voice of my mother, like saying, don't try anything new. You're just going to get in get trouble. Get a good job. Get a good like, job. <laughs> like, you like, don't, don't take chances. Like that's the inner, that's the inner monologue that I hear all yeah. day long. And then when, a few times I take the chance, something really shitty does actually happen. And it, and it affirms it. Now, if I look at, like, the, the scope of my life, I would say something shitty has not happened every time. But it happens enough times where you're like, God, like, should I not keep, should I not take the chance? I took the chance in finding my own voice and wrote that article about the Dodge Dart. And, yeah. and, and my mother told me she wanted to disown me and uh, never wanted to speak to me again and said, boo-hoo, your father killed himself. Get over it. What about me? Uh. You know, like I was devastated, especially because I didn't write anything about her right. other than she sold her car. You know, like I was terrified of taking over the job on Fuller House because I didn't know what kind of pain taking over that spot was going to bring. And then I get sued for doing it. Um, you know, so like there are myriad examples where taking the chance actually does bring pain. But you keep going. So five years ago, I was about to turn 50 because this is, I'm now actually returning to your initial question. I swear I was, <laughs> I was listening. There's a logic to this. That's all good. <clears throat> but one of the things I was like, like writing a book, one of the things that I thought like, oh my God, I'm going to die and never having done stand up as a grown up, And not because I don't think I'm good enough, but because I'm terrified. Right. I, I'm living. I'm living through fear, and letting fear deny me opportunity. So for f five times that year, I got up on stage and I just did it. And I and like the first time was a disaster. Oof! I can't imagine how much that hurts. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, I was like, I could I could just like do it once and say it was a disaster and it's a funny story. Yeah. Or I'm gonna or the, I'm gonna do the much harder one which is I'm going to fight through it and do it a Get second back. time. Yeah. Because the first time I'm like, oh, I haven't done it since college. I think I'm going to be pretty good. In my mind, I kept envisioning people saying like, really? You're not a pro? 
You have right. like I thought I was going to get like my own sitcom, you know, just from open mic. Just on that. Yeah, just and on that. And this is open mic. This actually had a comedy show. Yes, an yeah, open okay. mic at a comedy place in the valley, and I, but I mean, there wasn't a laugh to be heard. Like you know, like <laughs> there were crickets, there were cobwebs, there were uh, like I heard swinging saloon doors. Yeah, anything that could indicate. <laughs> absolute silence i heard um yeah oh. but i was like okay i have to and this is all just about like my own psychological growth because yeah i'm not going to become a, i'm not going to become ray romano at 55 i'm not going to be like you know Stephen <laughs> Wright suddenly but just for my own well-being i'm like i'm turning 55 i'm turning 50 and i don't want to be afraid anymore yeah. I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of not having my own voice. Like one of the things I don't tell you about writing sitcoms is a majority of the time you're on someone else's show. And what you're doing is you're a high paid craftsman. You're replicating yeah. someone else's voice. And that's the gig. Yeah. You go in knowing that. But as far as like speaking in an authentic voice, you know, so I had so many ways to hide. I had a partner. I was on staffs of other shows. Like I was so far removed from what like my own feelings were until like the stuff that you're starting to see from me is all brand new in my life. This is not like, Oh, I came out of the womb this way or I came out of Brown this way. This is all since 2015, essentially. Okay. The, the, um, this is your voice just the last six years then a hundred five okay like when it like when everyone else was joining facebook in 2008 yeah i, I know there were younger people younger younger people and young and early adopters who were doing it early i didn't join till like late 2011 wow because, yeah, that and, is and like and it was an active choice it wasn't like Right. Tell me, like I wasn't my grandparent. Like, tell me what this Facebook is. You know, I'd already right. seen social network. I knew what it was, but I was terrified <laughs> of putting something out of putting something out there in my own voice. Wow. Not writing on a show, not writing with a partner, actually speaking in my own words, and not just that, but being susceptible to criticism. Yeah, that's the hardest part. It was like, oh my god, people from my high school are going to mock me. Yeah. Everyone's going to make fun of me. I don't think I could withstand the criticism. Like my fears about what people would say about me were so intense and so pronounced. I couldn't even join social media, even though my everyone in my family was on it, and I couldn't. Wow. Do it. <laughs> so I went from that to I now have a hundred eighty thousand Twitter followers, and I'm nobody, but just just from doing it and from being honest. So like. That was a pretty quick jump in terms of I, I physically can't do it because I feel like I will die and I can't stand the, what it really was is the exposure is putting yourself out there and like, yeah. you're going to find it. You're going to have a book out there. You're going to have your secrets out there. You're going to have your brother's passing out there. Yeah. You're, you know, you're what you perceived as limitations of a douchebag. It's all going to be out there and open for fair game for discussion and criticism and like that's how i am with this book like i really yeah. had to wrestle <clears throat> and i don't mean it was easy for me but i mean i really had to wrestle at every step of the way with kind of two steps forward and one step back and the one step back is my family's gonna hate me because i am portraying like and then like both my therapist and my wife and a lot of, you know, and a lot of friends really encouraged me and said, like, you don't have that much of a relationship with your family as it is. Right. It, and like, you're telling the truth. You're disguising the truth and you're doing it through fiction. So it's not a memoir in my case, but like, I really had to look at it from a cost benefit analysis and, and, and wonder, like, is it worth giving up my dream? to have written a book. And, and, and this is clearly a story I've had to tell. If I wrote it as an article, I wrote it as a pilot, and now I, I, 
as a novel, I wrote it in three weeks. This is clearly fuck. That's like, dude. That's like Kerouac writing. That's like well, Ker- the scroll, right? I mean, that's <laughs> on the road. Right. That's why you know I had amphetamines and I had Neil Cassidy <laughs> driving me. So like, <laughs> you know, fuck. in my case, it was you know coffee and a little Xanax. But like, it's not like it's not like it was three weeks from you know from soup to nuts. It was. I was coming at it. I had an outline that was 200 pages, you know, that I had put together in the previous months because that outline was based on, on the script that I had already written. So the structure, the structure wasn't changing because the structure was what actually happened. Well, right. That's, that makes it easier. <clears throat> and, and the events actually happened. Yeah. So, like, I was just getting it off my chest in a funny way. Um, so and is, and it, I, is it, is it self-deprecating like you? Oh, is it like your writing? Oh, I would say, I mean, I, I would describe it as a comic novel. I okay, mean, it is, I mean it, it's by far the best and funniest thing I've ever written. I'm still terrified to have it out of the world and, and know that, like, oh, my family is going to, like, not invite me to their funerals. And, you know, yeah. like, all those things, all those insecurities, you know, like, like to use the word you, you, you began with, they're still there. Like it's not like they it's not like it goes away, but you just get better at coping with it, managing it, compartmentalizing it, and also kind of gauging how important is it. Like, like I think it's way more important for me to tell my story and possibly help thousands of people than hope my mother's not gonna yell at me because there's a mother character. And the same with my brothers. And the same with my in-laws and like, yeah. um, does it, does it trouble me deeply that their people might hate me? Like, yeah, but it, I have to, i you know, like I said, like, and I don't want to sound like a douche, but like I'm on this journey towards greater authenticity and greater transparency. And this is like sort of the ultimate culmination of it. <laughs> like, this yeah, is that's... like, this is it. Like, I'm telling this, I mean, like I could fucking just throw it away or I could have not written it, but like my father did kill himself. It was out of the blue. It was a traumatic event and the family's response was completely horrific and dysfunctional. All of that is truth and it's my story. So, oh man, I can't wait to read it. I, I'll say this, I, I laugh out loud reading your articles. Wow. Every... Every single one of them, where so you have, really, you have so many good ones. The, the, it's really sweet. No, I mean, I, I no, it's just it's like even Gabe Gabe Kaplan's doppelganger as an example. We moved to the Jewish Alps in 1972, which I don't even know what the fuck that means. And you know, a liberal Jew fag, commie beta snowflake, because you talked about it being a Democrat. I mean, it's just like they're. And then you wrote one of your articles. I wrote an article recently that had tens of views. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, I love you. this no, dude. It no, was but, like, and, 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 and my b- being appreciative of what you're saying, I swear to God is sincere because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a professional essayist. I'd never written an essay. Like I had a column in the Brown Daily Herald that ended in 1988. In 2015, I wrote something for Huffington Post. That's a long fucking time in between writing something in your own voice. So, That's like, true. <coughs> but like, it's where you started with your own voice. And see, this is really cool for me to learn because I just assumed this was you as a writer because you've been writing for so many years. But this is all brand new. This is all brand new. I've been like, what's weird is like, I had a little of this voice at the end. Of of high school, you know, like I had a girlfriend, I was getting into Brown at Stanford and Berkeley, you know, like I had a li- <laughs> suddenly like, suddenly like I had a little, co- a little swagger. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, and that followed me into Brown a little. And like, I was like, I really felt like, wow, I'm like far enough removed from my high school that I'm going to be my, who I really am. <clears throat> but once I became someone in the professional world, my fear went up exponentially and i really re- just retreated into depression all i wanted to do was to hide and not be heard 
and not be exposed. So it's it's interesting. Wow. It has not. It is. It's so not been a straight shot. No, and, and, obviously and it's a weird, but, but 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 it's a weird peak and valley. Like I had it as a as a as a late teen, you know. And yeah, I we all have the confidence at eighteen. It was that the yeah. running joke? Because I wish I knew everything I knew at eighteen. It's, oh it's, my there's god, a piece to that, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's for sure. Yeah, but especially also, when you're getting, especially when you're getting laid and about to go into brown. Like those two things. Those two things. <laughs> those two things. But like. <laughs> But, like, I met my wife that year, like, my senior year in high school, and she wasn't even the, she wasn't even my girlfriend. She wasn't the one I was getting laid from. But she, but, like, she met me, like, truly at the peak of my confidence. So then when we reconnected years later, and I was a shell of a man, she still wow. remembers, she still remembers me as, like. Well, that's how you got her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I've often said, like, I wonder whether she would have married me had she met me any other year of my life. But like, if you I want think to, she meet, would. I think she would have. But if you want to meet me, like, senior year of high school, yeah, like, that was your year. That was it. I mean, <laughs> I even won the championships of debate. I mean, yeah. well, that's see, that's like, that is the this is that's exactly what I'm talking about then because I didn't know it was so fr- fresh that yeah. you just kind of came out and have your own voice now and you can write about your pain. And about, and this is the exact, I want you to come back on the show when you do put your book out, right? Sure. And, and I want to read it whenever you're comfortable with me reading it because if it's any if it's anything like the stuff I've read, I haven't read 60 of your articles, but I've probably read 40 of them. And no, it's, it's, much, it's much better than the articles, but... Uh, well, I would assume, and that, that kind of self-deprecation, I think is what we, you and me, us older guys need to propagate to the younger men. And that's a bigger piece of this thing for me is that we both felt emasculated by being unemployed. Yes. And this is all the time, right? I don't know. I wrote chapter 19 was about me being unemployed in 2003 after like the dot-com blom, boom, my agency went under and I was unemployed. And I remember going to the unemployment office and dealing with that. So I wrote about it, right? Yes. And then I went to a bachelor party with a bunch of guys from Wharton um, who I played hockey with and they're all stupid successful. Like, I mean, some of the biggest executives that you read about in, in the Valley today, they were in this little crew. And so you want to talk about feeling like small penis, big dudes, right? You're like, Holy shit. I feel so small. And I, I puff up when I get insecure. So I just become even more grandiose. My hair got bigger. I had black nail polish. You know, I was just, I go the opposite way. And that's why, I want this kind of shit to talk about. We have Matt, we have a tsunami of uh, anxiety and depression about to hit our culture, right? I mean, at a massive sure. level, dude. And, and if they can read a book like you that you have written, and I haven't read obviously, but, and get to know a guy like you and say, oh my God, that's, that's what it means to be a man today. It helps it takes the pressure off because if you're not a military hero, if you're not a captain of industry, if you're not sexually prolific, if you're not what we have been taught, then you're not a man. And if you're not a man, then who are you? Right. Right. But that's a, but that's a really narrow high standard. And and it's one that's not like, it's not not even close. Not even close. It's not realistic because if we've learned anything from this discussion is that success can come at any time. It's not a straight shot. It's not this linear journey where like you just keep going up and up. It's a lot of ebbs and flows. It's a lot of peaks and valleys in the book. And this is based on a real incident. I I talk about because a a lot, a lot of the book is about a guilt that I felt in the immediate aftermath that I couldn't help my father that because I was going through my own unemployment, that that he didn't feel comfortable enough to come to me and ask for help. And even though I know it's not my fault that he killed himself, it, it doesn't mean that there weren't moments where it felt like my fault. And I don't, I don't really blame myself, but I talk about it in the book um, that that year I had to go into Wells Fargo with a, uh, an old K Swiss box filled with, savings bonds that I had gotten as a bar mitzvah present. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You know, so I'm like, well, I'm trying to think, 
in the book, in the book, I, I think I made it contemporaneous with the year of the suicide. In reality, it had happened in 1999 during a previous unemployment. My daughter was had just been born. I'd left advertising. I'm trying TV. Oh, jeez. A show I was on got canceled three episodes in by Halloween. You know, I'm counting on a whole year's run, and right. we're done before we even got to November sweeps. And I'm out of money. I have no, and I have a baby. And my wife's home, and she stopped working. And I had I remember how, as a grown fucking man having to walk into Wells Fargo and cash my bar mitzvah presents. And like I talk about in the book, like in my yeah. mind, like the it's gonna signal this, send a special like bad signal to you know, like the Jewish elders in Haifa saying, like, there he is, the world's least successful Jew. But that's what it felt like, you know, because no one else was no one else I know is running out of money. And cashing right. over our mitzvah bumps, or at least they're not talking about it, you know. Like, but that's the piece, dude. No one's talking about it, but ev- there's so many people. But in like, forget position. going to Brown. Like, I went to the posh all boys high school where, like, you know, my my contemporaries were like the mayor of Los Angeles, the chairman of ABC, yeah, um, senators' you know, like, kids, senators' yeah. kids, a guy in my class dear friend of mine is the guy who beat the Nazis at the, uh, in the lawsuit to get back the, uh, the Klimt paintings. And they made a movie about him starring <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. And he got a hundred, I, I shouldn't say that, but he got $130 million in the settlement that he took on, you know, just, <laughs> you know, he took on retainer. And it's like, so there's guys who I used to like, you know, ride to debate tournaments with, who just pocketed $130 million the same year I'm cashing my bar mitzvah bonds. And that's sort of like, and I keep, Oh, that's a nice juxtaposition, isn't it? And I keep, you know, I, I keep seeking this, like, I keep thinking security is on its way, you know? Cause like I made, yeah. like, I made some fat dollar running Fuller House. Like yes, I finally did. got paid showrunner money. Yep. And I was like, Holy shit, like it's happening. Like after all these years. Yeah. And then suddenly I don't get a job after now. I didn't anticipate splitting with my partner. I didn't anticipate being fired by my agency, both of whom I were in, I was in relationships for 25 years. I didn't anticipate a pande- a global pandemic and an right. economic shutdown. And I certainly didn't think that like running a big show was not going to be a draw but might even be a deterrent because i'm i'm now a 55 year old man you know it, during the me too era during uh, you know black lives matter yeah era, but dude I'm, if there's anyone who's not me too <laughs> that would be you yeah no i, I am the I am opposite not, no i am i I've, i am not me too but i am in an era where and i totally support it where greater attention is being paid to creating more diverse writing staffs and yes. I am all for it, and I, I am not an angry white man complaining about that. But it certainly doesn't benefit me. No, it does not. And that's, that's, just, that's just a fact. And, yep. and again, I, I 100% agree with it, so I'm not complaining. You know, like, um, but, like, the truth is I'm 55. And I look well, around, and there's people running shows at 32. And they're, like, they're, and they're not looking yeah, for... Yeah, but comparing you know, yourself is a fucking catastrophe i mean it i have felt the same thing because every time i got a job offer and these are unabated i have buddies all over the industry now and yeah they get these big jobs ceo president of this holding company president of this agency and they're like joe i want you to come in and run this group for me and and i remember two or three of them that were pretty big and i was coming back from a keynote presentation in um the dominican and i'm sitting in the airport and i'm quiet and i'm never quiet so my wife leans over she says what's going on are the hamsters running? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I said, I got this offer from, you know, my buddy and it's a really good one, babe. It's like, you know, big dollars and stock nice. options and it's not a startup and wow. I need to take this. Because if you don't take it, I might. Yeah. And she, <laughs> this was two and a half years ago. So you're kind of out of luck. Okay. But she Damn. said, she said, uh, is this your ego? And I said, well, has it, is there anything else when it comes to this? And well, she said, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. She said, have you finished the book? And I said, no. She said, okay. 
So if you can get over your ego, I got this, you know, go do this. And I was like, got it. You have been given a gift. You've been given the gift of the gift of economic security to allow you to write it. That doesn't make it any easier. No, but I share it with you because it's, I think, I think you're on the cusp of your next you. Right. And this isn't like a Tony Robbins bullshit thing. I actually, what, what you're doing and how you suck this up. That's the, that's the hard part because even I had an executive coach to get me through this, you know, um, and he's a great dude and he's helping me a lot. And I have editors and I have publishers and I have a publicist and I have like all this stuff because I can, I can. And it, what I'm trying to get to here is that the last three years was the hardest three years of my life because I, I compared myself to all my buddies who are now CEOs and presidents and making, you know, gobs of money and they have bigger homes than I do. And they have their kids, college funds are are taken care of and everything's done, (laughs) you know? And I'm like, and and I'm 54 years old. So I'm like, babe, I'm, I pulled myself out of a career where I was at the top. And now if I go back, I don't, and I haven't gotten any offers in the last year, by the way. So they're gone away. Like that's gone. Like Joey Dubon, who, you know? And so I hear you, but I do believe that the fact that you completely Kerouac a book in three weeks about your life, about you being fucking hilariously and fucked up anxious your whole life, suffering from depression, dealing with suicide, dealing with your own suicidal ideation, all of that is then penned in a novel. There's no way that that's not going to do something for your career in and it doesn't mean, I don't mean just like in a profitable level. I mean that like you're in, you're, this whole last 15 months has just been a plateau, which sucks, hurts yeah. every day. I'm sure you're over, eating over the sink like I do. Oh but, my God, I can't wait to do it right as soon as we get off. Exactly. I'm well, I'm throwing pizza. I a plate of, a can of tuna <laughs> while we were doing this. I was like, what a snorer I'm going to be. <laughs> so I, I just think it's, I think it's been the, it will be one of those things just this is my prediction that will change well, the trajectory of the next 20 years of your life. I well, believe that, that is, that's what I hope. That's what I believe deep down. Good. It may not manifest. As long as you itself. have that belief, because the 20%. I do. I do. It, it may not manifest itself every day. And, and it's hard when you know, you know, I don't know how to pay. I don't know how to pay these actual bills. Right. No, um, I'm not, I'm not poo pooing that in any yeah. facet. Cause I've been there a lot and I know it, but I, but but to, but to your earlier point, like, I don't think I can see the whole picture yet. And I you say, can't. And I say this to my wife. I'm like, I'm like, yes, today I've got no response on the novel. But, like, if we look at the course of the entire year, like, pan out to the end of the year, like, someone might have bought it. Like, I'm or, I've already started my second one, you know, because. And like, that's have, what they want. That's what they but, want. You know, because I, you know, I had, a, I had this other idea first about writing about, ironically, because we were just speaking about it my senior year of high school, but also combining elements of a, of a boy losing his father to suicide. And so, like, I'm writing a second book about that and trying to, like, you know, really start to, like, throw myself into actual fiction writing and not just, like, kind of a, a, a Ramana cleft. And I'm like, so there's a chance we might look back on this year as, the single most fruitful and significant year of my life. Yeah. I mean, a year in which I overcame, like, when I, when I tell you, like, when, you know, that writing a book seemed like something I was more likely to die first than ever try. The fact that I tried it and finished it in whatever form it is, I, it might be too short, it might be a novella and not a novel, I might self-publish, I don't know what form it's going to take. But I truly thought that it was something I could not do. And that is entirely the voices of fear and doubt and insecurity that run repeatedly in my head. Like, I mean, they are on a continuous loop. It's like... Mine too. Mine are on a merry-go-round and they flip me off every time. It's like fucking anxiety and the depression sitting there. And then there's the... (laughs) And then it's like, fuck you, Joey, when they come by. I'm like, you know what? And then I have 80% of my life that is the, is the, I can do this. I got this, but I'm just telling you, man, it, there's no possibility that that kind of, because it's not, it's a culmination of years of anxiety. And then the story building in your head 
And that's why you did exactly what I'm talking about. You barfed that out. It had to come out and yeah. it came out in three weeks. That's epically cool. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I don't mean this like, yeah, maybe it's not. No, I, I know it's good. Like, I don't know that anyone wants to buy it or whatever that is, but that's different than, I really wanted to sort of bask in the achievement of trying it and doing it. And that I'm and still doing. And what I, what I talked about with my therapist is like, because there were moments of doubt where I was like, the pushback's going to be too great. Yeah. The, the, fear I'm, the fear I'm feeling about the response is so pernicious that why don't I just give it up? But then on the flip, and then she goes, well, okay, how would you feel if you did that? I was like, oh, but I said, if I gave this up and never wrote this book, I said, I would regret it my whole life. And she's yeah. like, so you have to do it. Um, and not just that, but we talked about, you know, I don't want to sound like I got a guy on The Bachelor, but we talked about this journey <laughs> that I'm on. And it's like journey about, and the whole fucking, I said like, Dr. Tall, like, tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels like this entire journey of the last 15 years of therapy has been a journey to find my own voice and not and to not be afraid of expressing it. <clears throat> and, and I said, this book, which actually is only my voice, only my experience, and me processing the traumas and pains and vicissitudes of, of my family of origin. I said, this feels like the culmination of everything that we've talked about. And for me not to do it because I'm afraid that my mom is going to be pissed or my aunt might send me a nasty right. email. And, and, I'm already, will. and I sent it and I let an aunt see it. And, and I got a and like really negative feedback. I think very defensive <laughs> oh, about God. You know, what, the, what the family is going to think. Yeah. But, you know, I just, and roll with the punches. And, the, and, and, and one other thing I wanted to mention, because you know, because you had such nice words earlier, and they were so encouraging. Like the 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 fact is, I wasn't going to do this podcast. When you when you asked me, my first instinct was no, and that was my second instinct. <laughs> and I was thinking of bailing out even after I said yes. I was wondering just, if you would, just because, like, I'm not in a good place. No, like, I'm not like feeling feeling like I'm living my best life right now. And yet, and yet I know that there's, I know that there's a lot of value in saying that. Yeah. And I also know that it's very cathartic to say that. Yeah. Um, and being able to talk to you about just like, like these sort of life trajectories and how it's not simple and linear and, and, and predictable and how we can be on top of the world at one point and, begging for cash in another or, or, yep. or comparing yourself to your, you know, swinging dick CEO friends or, <laughs> or my guy who fought the Nazis in, in, you know, in Austrian Supreme court. And, you know, like, yep. <clears throat> or me carrying the case Swiss box, of, you know, <laughs> of, uh, of old <laughs> decrepit Israeli bonds, bonds. <laughs> you know, there are bits of bonds and certificates for trees in Tel Aviv, you know, like, all of this shit, like, is part of the story. It is. Like, and I think, I think you're doing a real, I wish you great, great luck and great mitzvah on this, on this journey that you're undertaking, both with the book and with the podcast. I think you're doing an incredible service in terms of trying to demystify male feelings. I mean, and I don't mean to put yeah. words in your mouth about no, that's what, it. What, what your goal is, but that's what I've gathered from what we've talked about today is that the more we can show men, anyone obviously, but, but men specifically yeah. really need to learn the lesson that, you know, like Rosie Greer said, it's all right to cry. Yeah. It's all right to have feelings. It's all right to express the feelings. The feelings aren't going to always be positive. Like, yeah. I mean, they didn't tell me that at my golden boy high school. They said, you're going to go out there and conquer the world. They never said you're going to go out there and some days you're going to conquer the world and some days you're going to be out of money and like punching the computer because like you can't get your unemployment to refresh. Like, like yeah. those are all part of the, of the experience. Um, That's exactly it. And 
you know, I guess like what we, what I would tell you and because you just told me something very similar is to not get so down when it seems down because it will change. Like we now have, like when you have one data point, you're like, Oh, that's what it's going to be. We now have enough data points in our life to say there's going to be ups and downs and ebbs and flows and you know, like something good, it will probably come out of something, you know, very bad. And like, if I can get, if I can get lots of good out of my father's suicide and I don't, and I would do anything for him to still be alive and have none of that to write. But if, but if that sort of catapulted me into finding my own voice, into not giving into fear into writing about the family and my own feelings and my own emotions and the dynamics in the family that engendered those fears. Like there's a lot of good that came out of it. And I don't think, you know, and and again, that's not to minimize a suicide. It's not to, it's not to say like that I wished for it in any way, but like what I always tell people is like, I didn't ask for it. That's the card I was dealt. Like that's the hand so I, I can either do nothing with it and benefit no one, including myself, but hide, keep secret, and have it boil up inside until, until I, you know, there's man- physical manifestations of the pain, or I can keep writing about it, telling my story, speaking my truth, having a voice, and hopefully it, it can help someone else either do the same or process their grief, you know, or just, you know, see that people are able to be resilient, you know, in the face of trauma. So buddy, that's it. I I'll say this when uh, the lights come back on with our culture because of the vaccination, I'm going to drive down to LA and you and I are going to have dinner together. I'm going to hug you. Great. We're I can't about- wait. We'll start our own ad agency and we're start like, our own- <laughs> we're take over. Cause we're both unemployed and can't that's find work. That's right. Fuck you, Jeff. Good <laughs> meet you. <laughs> you don't have to put that in there. No, but, I don't uh, know. So how long did we go? We went pretty far. Yeah, we this, did. It's, it's, this might be a two parter. I don't know. Two hours, two hours and twenty seven minutes. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I nobody's listening all the way through. But <laughs> I don't think it's funny. Um, you do whatever you want with it. Oh, here, hold on but a sec. Take, I'm going to pause I'm gonna this. Take a couple more pictures. But you were amazing, and uh, I just you're going to be my new buddy. That's just all there is. Yeah, this was fantastic. I really didn't know what did I realize? Hey, we were both in San Francisco advertising at the same time which uh exactly you know i was i was was happy to see you know but you know i got out what we still called it the ad game that's how old i am but uh (laughs) they still call it the ad game but this was great this was this was i I hope this was i hope you get what you need but i hope uh, you did too i I thank you for doing this because obviously you were not overly stoked about doing it and when someone talks to you about hey i want to talk I have a podcast that talks about pain and insecurity yeah, and anxiety. No, I, That's not a great intro. <laughs> no, it's not you know. a great intro, but so, it goes to the exact point we were trying to make earlier, which yeah. is like, fuck it. Like, yep. like just deal with the pain, like fuck steer it into it rather than steer away from it. Yeah. Like it's part of life. It's better to talk about pain. So I felt I owed you that. And uh, I wish you nothing well. but luck. You're a good man. Thank you, uh-huh. sir. And I will, uh, you let me know when this is on. I will promote the fuck out of it. So. I sure will. <laughs> Thank <All right>. you. <laughs>